Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you say this in these, uh, these times, but anyway, dear participants of this uh, conference on the Arctic uh, and the changing dynamics of the Arctic, um, I'm so pleased to see you all here. I'm so pleased to welcome. I think I'll sit down. I won't have the, the, this uh, thing in my head. Um, but I have been given the very difficult task of summarizing a roundtable discussion we had this morning before uh, this conference. Uh, and the, just to summarize some of the discussion points that we had, that, which will be reflected also in the discussions here this afternoon. Um, but at this morning's roundtable, uh, we had a very interesting and complex and somehow also intertwined discussion on different issues, um, on geopolitics in the Arctic um, and the changing dynamics, on the extraction industry and the opportunities for economic development in the Arctic, and then also the operational capabilities and what are the needs uh, in terms of the Arctic. Um, there is, uh, in the Arctic region, um, it was stated very clearly that there is, of course, the Arctic region is also influenced by the geopolitics of the world as such. Uh, it's part of international security structure. So there is, of course, the, what we see, the, the increasing um, tension between the U.S. or increasing competition between the U.S. and China will also have a spillover effect into how the dynamics of the Arctic. But on the other hand, you also have a, a governance structure such as the Arctic Council in which uh, China is not a member, for example, and where you have discussions around more softer issues and where you also have representatives of small, medium and superpowers and greater powers. So in that way, you also provide opportunity for a voice of those who are, uh, have smaller powers, including then also the people of the Arctic uh, who are also represented and as we learned, not only, not always agree amongst each other in the discussion. So it's not necessarily the fact that, that just if, uh, let's say Denmark says one thing as, as the kingdom of Denmark and then you have uh, the people from Greenland saying something else and then you would have, there would be a disagreement with with the, the, the Canadians, for example. So there's a lot of, it's, it's, it's like it's open discussions and it's a very good forum for further discussion on very different issues. Um, and then we also learned that there is a lot of possibilities within, you could say, more softer uh, security issues, such as uh, search and rescue uh, missions that we can do common, we can carry out joint uh, exercises within the search and rescue and which also provides opportunity for taking some of the, the global uh, tension out of things and putting it into a, a more smaller form. So on the one hand, yes, there is uh, influence, there are problems, uh, there is uh, tension, but on the other hand, there are a lot of possibilities for actually breaking that uh, tension. With regard to uh, economic uh, and research and extraction industry, there's a uh, uh, it was stated very clear that, that it's important to think about having a sort of an organic economic development, which actually takes into consideration uh, uh, not only the, that, you know, the values that you can actually commoditize or monetize, but also takes into consideration the, the culture, the history, the traditions, and how you actually develop and you could say a sustainable economy and a, uh, econ a sustainable development at the same time. Um, and of course, people down here, if I'm saying something which is not quite right, please uh, let me know. Um, there's the whole area of maritime fishing, which is a huge potential. Uh, as I learned, 90% uh, of uh, the Greenlandic um, gross national product comes from from fisheries, and I know that in the Barents Sea, there's a strong cooperation between Russia and Norway around developing of fisheries, and that might be something that we can consider for the future, how to, to make common development of uh, fishery management in order to actually make good use of, of, of this uh, potential. Um, and um, then, um, 
lastly, we were at the um, operational capabilities. Uh, and here we had uh, a stressing that the fact that if you want to have a strong operation in, 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 and a proper operation in, in the Arctic, you need to carry out joint and uh, multidimensional operations. You cannot just have one, the Navy or the, um, um, the, the air, <laughs> it's not uh, Air Force, yeah, but you actually had to carry out, see all the dimensions of uh, everything. And the whole issue around infrastructure, uh, you have to take all kinds of logistics into consideration. <laughs> um, and then also that the, um, there are some opportunities within data sourcing that we s s haven't made use of. There are some enormous uh, opportunities for data sourcing that is not only within the, 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 you know, the, the Danish realm, but should, could also be used across the Arctic to actually to tell us a lot about the things that we need to know. And finally, the multiple purpose ships and containers can provide huge new potential and, and uh, ideas to the Arctic. Uh, and I'm sure that you'll hear more about it in a little while. So as I'm not the nerd on these issues, I won't go more into it. But with these words, let the conference begin. I'll pass on the word to Martin Brehm, who will be our moderator for today. Martin it will be coming out with a book next week on Greenland and uh, the American Connection. And the American Connection. And uh, is also an author, an Arctic expert, and a journalist, uh, and have been, I don't know, for how many years working on the Arctic. So I'm very happy to. Thank you, Martin, and welcome. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to sit here. It's very, uh, in this very prestigious company. I, I was lucky enough to uh, listen in on the roundtable this morning, and I can assure you, you're in for a treat. Uh, we have some very distinguished foreign guests with us, as well as the, uh, the expertise um, from Denmark available. So, so this is indeed a, a unique uh, opportunity. Um, two minutes, uh, and, and I want to share with you an experience uh, very recent. I was uh, in July, in late July, uh, on a Swiss-Danish scientific expedition to the very north of Greenland. Uh, we were in, uh, actually we ended, uh, or at least we passed, uh, the very, very northern tip of Greenland. Those of you who are familiar with the geography knows that it's called Cap Moisjesop, and north of there, there's a tiny little island called Kaffeklubben Island and so forth. Very exotic, uh, but also very thought-provoking to spend time in that region. Um, as you know, there is no... Uh, people living there, there is absolutely no infrastructure. Um, it is a mind-blowing experience. It's exceedingly beautiful um, and majestic. There are very, very tall mountain ranges, humongous glaciers. Um, it's all barren. There are no trees, of course, uh, very little plant life. The scientists were ecstatic that they had an opportunity to even go there because very, very few people ever, ever travel there. Um, and the in, in the context of this conference, I revisited uh, in my thoughts uh, this very specific area. Uh, we've been talking this morning of the lack of infrastructure, for instance, and I've never, I've been to the North Pole, I've been to Antarctic, the Antarctic, but I've never felt further away from, let's say, the rest of the world as I felt in the north of Greenland. Uh, and this is an area where, of course, uh, the defense forces, but also in the future, perhaps, uh, more people with a commercial interest will uh, have to work. We spend uh, several nights in a mining camp there. There's an Australian mining camp who are attempting to establish a mine because they have found which they believe to be one of the world's largest deposits of zinc, which the world will need very badly uh, in a short while because you need zinc to do proper steel. Uh, and so forth. Uh, there was a geologist on this trip who was looking for all sorts of different minerals in this extremely remote part of the world. 
So it's remote, um, it's beautiful, it has, as we were also talking about this morning, a huge potential for delivering what you could call ecological uh, services or, or uh, pleasure. Uh, the fact that there is nobody there will be a commodity in the future or a luxury that many people will crave and ask for. So in many senses, this remoteness became a thought-provoking experience, just communications. Even the satellite telephones were not reliable uh, in that kind of environment in the Arctic. So obviously, if you have to look in an operational fashion uh, that you have to go there and work there or provide defense or coastal services, coast guard services of any kind, uh, there is indeed a lot to be uh, considered. And this is what we'll talk about uh, today in many different aspects of the world. Uh, also, we'll talk about security uh, in the hard sense of the word. Uh, you all know of the increased, uh, let's say, buildup of military capacities that is happening in the Arctic, um, in any uh, Arctic state. Of course, we have been all uh, very concerned and, and occupied by the buildup in, in Russia. Uh, but this, of course, has taken place basically across the board. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to now ask uh, the, uh, those who are here physically, I'll ask you in a minute to step up first. I need to uh, also look very uh, straight in this direction uh, because there is a camera that I'm no now looking into because uh, we should not forget that there are people out there who are streaming this conference live. Uh, we're streaming through the website of the Danish Foreign Policy Society, but also through the Hudson Institute, one of the most prestigious think tanks in Washington, who is uh, a partner in this conference. Uh, you will have distinguished guests from there in a minute. Um, so welcome to all of you who are with us uh, online. Uh, I should add that we will welcome your questions and interventions very much. And uh, if you exit your full screen, you will find a little window where you can add your question, which will go directly to Lise Lade, who is right here, who will then try and catch my attention uh, to get the question out into the audience. So you are very welcome. I know there are people from China with us, and I urge you in particular uh, to add your questions, if at all uh, you feel the urge. Uh, and with those words, uh, I think it's time for me to invite of course, the real people up here. Uh, so can I ask those of you present, Kenneth um, and uh, uh, Rasmus, and uh, the third one here, Sarah, uh, to step up, please, and take a chair. Should we put Sarah in the middle just for the beauty of it? Uh, and um, then I will introduce, uh, as we go, the guests. We also have two people who will be with us or, uh, on the screen. Presently, you can see, and I will introduce them first, uh, Alexander Sergunin, who is a professor at the Department of International Relations at St. Petersburg State University, uh, of course, in St. Petersburg. And also with us is, um, where is your name? And Michael Mann is here, a special envoy uh, for the Arctic, or, or Arctic ambassador for the EU. Thank you very much for being with us, Michael. And we have Professor Taylor Fravel uh, from uh, the uh, Massachusetts Insti Institute of Technology. I'll introduce you all uh, more thoroughly as you are uh, given the floor. Uh, first of all, I will ask those of you who are with us online to turn off your microphones uh, just for the sake of, um, of bandwidth. Um, very briefly for now, Rasmus next to me, uh, Rasmus Gilsø Bertelsen is a professor uh, in Tromsø in northern Norway. He is presently also mentally in China because he's teaching a course over there. Um, and Sara Olsby, of course, many of you know already because she was in parliament here and in Greenland for many years, but presently writing a PhD on uh, Greenland's um, foreign policy and relations with the US. But Kenneth Weinstein, it's, uh, you are up first, as you know, and I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you. In particular, you have traveled uh, very far to come here, uh, or sort of um, ignore, not ignoring, but of course uh, battling with uh, all the uh, issues of, uh, of Corona, of COVID, so thank you very much for that. Kenneth Weinstein was for nine years the president 
and the chief executive officer of the Hudson Institute in Washington. Many of you will know this as, as one of the very, very influential think tanks in the US. He's now a distinguished fellow in the same institute. And um, Kenneth had, uh, has promised to speak about the US uh, and the US's role in the Arctic, although I know uh, that for very understandable reasons, uh, Afghanistan is of, co of course uh, very much on top of your agenda right now and, and, and I believe uh, on the thoughts uh, uh, all the time. Uh, but even so, and if you make the connection, uh, I'll be even happier. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the uh, title of your intervention now, I, I should say that everybody has been asked to speak for about five minutes and at the end of the session there will be time for questions from all of you. Uh, but right now, uh, Kenneth Weinstein, the next five minutes or so are all yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. I'm delighted to uh, be here, uh, especially delighted that Hudson Institute is one of the uh, sponsors of this uh, conference with the uh, Danish uh, Foreign Policy uh, uh, Society. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real thrill to be back in Copenhagen. It's a real thrill to also be back in Europe and to be off American soil, at least for a few days. Uh, look, the Arctic, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, and I will loop Afghanistan in at the end. Look, the Arctic, as we all know, is a region that's undergoing significant change, primarily driven by climate. Climate is the urgent focus for the Biden administration, though the administration is yet to uh, give, uh, release its Arctic strategy or its climate strategy. Uh, there are obviously, with the climate change that has occurred, there are obviously threats that uh, we need to deal with, but there are also uh, possibilities, as, as we all know, for economic development with proper stewardship as well. And these are the issues that we need to balance, that everyone needs to balance, and we can talk about this a bit more in the discussion. Uh, let, me, let me begin by talking about regional cooperation, which is so essential in the Arctic. It was the central focus of the first U.S. Arctic strategy, which the Clinton administration released in the immediate post-war era. Uh, it still matters deeply for the United States, as, as we are members of the Arctic Council. Uh, we deeply value the cooperation through the Council. We value the cooperation uh, also of the uh, indigenous peoples of the region. We value the, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum. Uh, and we also value uh, the Arctic Security Forum and the extraordinary array of scientific, environmental, and research cooperation that have become so important, including those highlighted recently by Secretary Blinken on his recent uh, trip to the Kingdom of Denmark. But in recent years, as these collaborations have grown, there's become a much greater focus for the United States on security concerns. Uh, this is, we are in the era in the United States we call of great power competition, and we see Russia, which is the biggest player in the Arctic, returning to a focus on economic development, but also uh, uh, we see it seeking a return to its great power status through militarization and particularly in the Arctic. As well as we see China with its uh, growing economic presence in the region, self-proclaimed near Arctic power with the Polar Silk Road, which uh, is its plan to accompany the Maritime Belt and Road and the Central Asian Belt and Road with all of the incumbent challenges that that poses. Uh, so the injection of great power competition, I would argue, the United States is responding to. Uh, and it means in some sense, unfortunately, that the era, the sort of pure era of Arctic exceptionalism uh, is ending. This doesn't mean that the Arctic isn't an extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, pristine area of remarkable international cooperation, but that the cooperation has to be looked at in a different light. Uh, so in addition to a broad focus on climate and regional cooperation, Security, sovereignty, economic development are central and interwoven. We are a, a Pacific Arctic nation by virtue of Alaska, but we also have indirectly an Atlantic Arctic presence uh, through our NATO partners, obviously the Kingdom of Denmark, uh, with our important air base at Tula in Greenland, essential for NATO air defense and space situational awareness, obviously also with our close partnership with Canada and with Norway. Um, Russia and China are, are obviously bolstering their regional presence. Both nations uh, have the right to engage in economic activities to promote their vital sovereign interests. 
Um, certainly, as long as, as it is done in accordance with the uh, rule of law. Uh, but there are obviously fundamental questions about Russian uh, behavior in the Arctic, uh, uh, charging ships for icebreaker-led passage in international waters in violation of international law, uh, projecting its, wa its power beyond Russia with incursions into Danish, Norwegian, and U.S. waters, and most importantly, posing a growing threat for, to the U.S. homeland and to that of our uh, NATO allies. Uh, as climate conditions have changed, Russia is reactivating its former Soviet bases, bolstering its northern fleet and greatly enhancing its, its uh, capabilities. Uh, there's massively increased activities at the uh, submarine base at the Kola Peninsula, and there's planned enhancements such as the test next week of a nuclear-powered hypersonic missile. That is a, a serious security threat. The presence of MiG-31, planned presence of MiG-31 long-range fighters armed with hypersonic missiles, long-range coastal defense systems armed with offensive platforms that include long-range cruise missiles. And we in the United States, and I think our NATO allies as well in the region, need to be concerned that uh, this could give uh, Russia escalation dominance, particularly against East Coast U.S. cities that have no missile defense capabilities and also against key regions here. Uh, so uh, as a result, uh, we need to do more militarily. We have come up with a number of new strategies, an Air Force strategy, a Naval strategy, uh, and we are returning to the Arctic, which we had really stepped away from largely since the Cold War. We need to step up our presence for anti-submarine warfare, but we have, the problem is we have been so unfocused on the Arctic, there are so many fundamental needs we have, whether it be ice hardening ships. We only have, our Navy doesn't have an icebreaker, only our Coast Guard does. Uh, and icebreakers are essential for freedom of navigation exercises, search and rescue missions. We need all weather expeditionary bases, equipment for handling Arctic conditions. Uh, it takes us days for our cutters to get to the Arctic in a crisis that is unacceptable. Uh, and as part of this, the Air Force is also trying to be ever more present in the region. But here we also need to make fundamental investments uh, to handle polar conditions and to also dramatically improve our communication systems. We don't have redundancies in, in the Arctic where satellite passages overhead are, are, are few and far between and communications get dropped quite easily, leaving us also vulnerable to Russian uh, electronic warfare capabilities. Now, the China challenge is a very different challenge for us. It's not a military threat. Uh, though there is some talk about China eventually placing strategic submarines in the Arctic. Uh, there, is, there, are, there are concerns about dual-use facilities that China may take advantage of, but this is more a threat along the Belt and Road Initiative using checkbook diplomacy to try to meet the massive thirst for in infrastructure with the aim of uh, using confiscatory economic loans uh, to obtain strategically sensitive facilities. Um, and embedding itself in Arctic institutions. And hence, there was the grave concern in the United States over uh, Chinese investments in deep water ports and airport facilities in Greenland in particular. Uh, and so you see now a much bigger United States focus uh, on Greenland, the Faroe Islands, the reopening of our consulate in Nuuk. Uh, we clearly need to engage on all these fronts. The needs are massive, balancing climate change and economic development, balancing cooperation, with the challenge of great power competition. In the US, we've been much better at producing strategies than at taking concrete steps and implementing them. Um, we need to do all we can cooperatively, uh, knowing that our NATO allies and partners who are profoundly frustrated, uh, disappointed in us, uh, in the way that the uh, Afghanistan windup uh, has been held, and this is, uh, and I would agree completely with um, the uh, CDU uh, chancellor uh, candidate, uh, um, uh, Armin Laschet, who said this was the, uh, the, uh, the biggest, uh, he didn't use the word catastrophe, but he said this was the biggest debacle in the history of NATO. And the, the alliance, I think, is very deeply hurting. But the Arctic challenge is, uh, the, our Arctic partners uh, are our most valued and trusted assets in the region. And the, the threat to them is security-wise is, is growing. And so it's increasingly important that we do more together to, to meet these challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Um, I wish we had a map now uh, from, I usually 
when I do talks on, on the Arctic, I, I use the map from the CIA World Factbook uh, of Greenland, because there, Greenland is presented as a huge block of land on top of America. And we often forget that Greenland is part of America. And geographically speaking, it's part of North America. Uh, and, and I think what you've just done was very helpful in, in simply telling in very simple terms how uh, there is a perception of a military threat from the Arctic. And Greenland simply plays a role because it's on the, on the way to that threat. Um, so thank you very much for that. I, th I think we understand by now in Denmark the, uh, the feeling of insecurity that has been growing in the U.S. as per se the, the buildup in Russia. Uh, the missiles are closer, uh, they're faster, they're hypersonic, and etc. as you just explained. What is, I think, a little harder to, um, to materialize now is the exact picture of the Chinese threat, if we can use that word, in the Arctic. As you say, it's very different. But even so, we have all now heard of the, uh, the collaboration, the talks between the U.S. and the Danish government and Greenland about the Chinese so-called presence in China, but there are basically no Chinese in Greenland. Um, so how exactly should we understand the U.S. thinking on China in the Arctic? Look, I, I think our, our, our feeling on China is that China is trying to use its economic power uh, to, uh, and its uh, technological capabilities to, uh, um, as part of its attempt uh, to uh, become the dominant world power. Uh, and that uh, this includes trying to control undersea cables, trying to uh, control 5G systems, uh, taking big data, sending it back to, uh, to China so that China has full situational awareness of all sorts of things from uh, personal health information to uh, locations of uh, airplanes, ships, submarines, and the like. Um, and that uh, Ch China is really trying to use its economic power to uh, obtain critical assets, create dependencies on China, attempt to get these, uh, these critical assets. I think we've done a great job in the West at exposing both uh, Huawei and uh, by exposing uh, the Belt and Road uh, program for what it is. And so you're not going to see many places like the port, the Hambantada port in Sri Lanka that is, you know, essentially turned over to China. But it is, we've got to be utterly aware that uh, uh, of the uh, less than fully transparent intent of uh, the Chinese when they come uh, uh, seeking engagement. So to be very specific, what would you advise uh, the Greenlandic government to do? They, as you know, it's a tiny economy. There's only 57,000 people. Um, what should the Greenlandic government do next time the Chinese um, industry proposes an investment in Greenland? I think you've got to look at it very carefully. Uh, you've, you've, you know, you've got to see, you've got to sort of look at what it actually brings Greenland. Uh, the, 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 it's one thing to sell fish to China. It's another thing to invite the Chinese in. Uh, and, and when they come in, they often build their own factories. They don't create jobs. They often will use these uh, facilities. Uh, it's no big secret. Uh, you travel in Africa, you go somewhere and you see a big you see an incredible new building, uh, you know, in, in in one of these African capitals, and you start asking, and try to, oh, that's the uh, that's the defense ministry. Wow, that's a lot of money. Well, who did it? Oh, the Chinese built it for us. And then later on, people found out the facilities were completely bugged, and so you've you've got to be very careful as to, you know, what kinds of engagements you will you will seek with the Chinese. What levels you have to have extraordinary transparency. Uh, and I would also seek other forms of financing. The United States, as a result of the Belt and Road Campaign, we fundamentally restructured our development finance uh, uh, organization so that uh, we now have hundreds of billions of dollars that we are willing to invest in places with business loans, sometimes taking an equity stake, but a, a normal transparent business practices to encourage economic development. And so, uh, I think that uh, f for businesses that will 
that the, the, whose primary purpose is to do business and not to serve some other nefarious uh, purpose that one doesn't know. So I, I urge people to just be very careful and uh, think twice before engaging. Thank you, Kenneth, so much. And, and thank you for taking part in the, in the forthcoming discussions as well. I'll turn to another very large actor uh, in the Arctic, um, not as, uh, let's say, well known as the US in the Arctic, um, but uh, nonetheless, a very important player in the Arctic, namely the EU. Uh, and we're fortunate enough to have the Arctic ambassador or the Arctic uh, special uh, envoy of the EU uh, with us, Michael Mann, as I said. Uh, former ambassador to Iceland also for the EU. Uh, and Michael has promised to uh, give us his take on the EU's role in the Arctic. So Michael, I welcome you once again um, and invite you to uh, speak for about five minutes from now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed. I, I hope you can hear me okay as I'm a long way away. Can you hear me okay? We hear you perfectly well and we see you perfectly well, so watch out. Fantastic, I better, yes, look my best. Well, thanks very much uh, indeed to uh, the Danish Foreign Policy Society, to Naval Team Denmark and the Hudson Institute for the invitation to speak at this excellent panel today. And I think the topic is, of course, very timely. Um, I think we've become rather familiar now with online and hybrid events, but I must admit that I regret also that I couldn't come to Copenhagen in person today. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, hopefully this will all become easier fairly soon. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has set a high level of ambition for what she calls her geopolitical commission. And with my direct boss, the High Representative Vice President Joseph Borrell, working for a stronger Europe in the world, the EU is of course expected to respond to the profound changes that we see going on in the Arctic. We will of course do this in the European way. And I'd like to elaborate now a little bit on the EU's growing Arctic engagement. Um, we have been giving a lot of thought uh, over the last few months to the question of great powers in the Arctic. Uh, I noticed that from the title. Um, that's because we have been working intensively to update the EU's Arctic policy uh, with what will be called a joint communication from the European Commission and the High Representative, which will hopefully be adopted uh, by October this year. We've actually this morning just uh, hopefully put the uh, finishing uh, touches to, to the draft. Um, this, of course, coincides very nicely with the COP26 meeting in Glasgow in November. Um, as I always say, and this is something that people don't often think about, the EU is in the Arctic. Firstly, through our three Arctic member states, the Kingdom of Denmark, Sweden and Finland, but also through our role as lawmakers in the European economic area, which also includes Norway and Iceland. And of course, our close relations with both Greenland and the Faroe Islands. <clears throat> But we also have an Arctic policy because we have strategic and day-to-day -day interests in sustainable Arctic development and peaceful cooperation in the Arctic. Now, the, the eight Arctic states have managed to cooperate to an extent that we do not always see in other theatres around the world. And therefore, I'm always rather surprised that uh, I get asked relatively often uh, since I took up this job in April 2020, both by journalists and by think tanks, how the EU sees the potential confrontation scenarios in the Arctic. This is, for me, particularly curious because it takes the attention away from the already existing crisis, a real existential crisis, the urgency of which has just been underlined in the IPCC report. Climate change is clearly the most comprehensive threat the Arctic is facing, and it's reached an unprecedented crisis point. The Arctic is especially sensitive to global warming, as we know that minimum temperatures have risen three times as fast in the Arctic as on the planet in average, on, on average. Uh, current Arctic sea ice cover is at its lowest level since at least 1850. It's projected to reach practically ice-free conditions at its summer minimum at least once before 2050. And of course, this has a number of knock-on effects, causing sea levels to rise, disturbing weather systems, leading to coastal erosion, biodiversity loss, and the destruction of associated ecosystems, and potentially also triggering key tipping points. The loss of reflection due to shrinking sea ice, which is called the albedo effect, and the massive release of greenhouse gases due to the thawing of permafrost, they further accelerate climate change. The dire consequences, exacerbated by environmental degradation, extend to the whole planet, 
and they profoundly affect nature and people in multiple ways, some of which are only just becoming apparent. Indigenous peoples are particularly hard hit and their traditional ways of life. And the worsening situation will also undermine the prospects for future generations. The EU is very proud to regard itself as the global leader in the battle against climate change, and it's ready to play its full part and assume its global responsibility through its new climate law and the recent Fit for 55 package of legislation ahead of COP26. Climate action is, of course, of particular importance to the Arctic, given the immense knock-on effects of Arctic warming. The European Green Deal will be at the heart of the EU's Arctic engagement, together with its new approach for a sustainable blue economy, supported through science, innovation and regional investment. We also want to stimulate the green transition in Arctic regions, while at the same time offering Arctic populations long-term socio-economic perspectives. And as the global champions of multilateralism, we will look to deepen our cooperation with our partners both inside and outside the Arctic region. And the EU, uh, not only in the Arctic, but, uh, but particularly in the Arctic, has sometimes been criticised for being a payer more than a player in Arctic matters. But the fact is that the EU has a decisive impact on the ground and an important role in the successful multilateral and regional cooperation in the Arctic. In preparing for our updated Arctic policy, our current programmes have been subject to external evaluation by a consortium uh, of consultancies who documented the EU's CO2 and black carbon emissions, our marine litter, shipping, tourism, and consumption of fish and, and raw materials in a very comprehensive report. They also looked at the EU's contribution of more than 200 million euros for Arctic research under Horizon 2020, and more than a billion euros for regional development and cross-border cooperation in the European Arctic and beyond. I'll stop there um, just by way of background, I think. So um, I'm very much looking forward to discussing this and how it relates to other Arctic powers with this distinguished panel. And of course, I'm extremely happy to take any questions that anyone might have for me. Thanks very much again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for also bringing so forcefully into the discussion the issue of climate change, which is, of course, uh, an overwhelming uh, force in the Arctic, as everybody here knows. Um, now, to just ask you to very briefly tell us, is there, I know there is, so, so what kind of thinking is going on within the Commission, um, within the EU Foreign Service, when it comes to hard security? Obviously, uh, the EU's role in this particular field of Arctic politics is, is evolving all the time, and I know that you and others have been talking about an increased potential role for the EU when we talk hard security. What's the status on that? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. I mean, I think it's important for me to point out uh, that obviously when we're drawing up our Arctic policy, we've had uh, three iterations of our Arctic policy so far, and our, our next one will be out shortly. We have to, of course, take account of the competences that were given, the powers that were given by our treaty. So obviously we're not hard security providers in the Arctic in the same way that uh, you know, the US or NATO or, or Russia or whatever would be. But of course, we cannot ignore uh, the issue of hard security. Clearly, as other panelists and, and people have said today, um, there is a, a buildup of military capacity in the Arctic regions. Um, but we have to sort of, you know, cut our cloth to what uh, to, to, the, to the powers that we're given. However, that doesn't exclude the fact that we can uh, play an important role, I think, in monitoring the situation. We are hoping to uh, build on strategic foresight uh, cooperation that we have with some of our partner countries and with NATO. Uh, we have uh, the possibility um, with our very advanced satellite monitoring systems to keep an eye on the security situation. And of course, you know, we, we can't join in with the sort of um, type of, of, of defence chiefs dialogue that, uh, that may or may not uh, happen at some stage. But, you know, we, we are closely working with our partners. We have a great deal of capacity. But when it comes to uh, security in the European Union uh, definition of Arctic security, we have to take a broader definition. So we, for us, uh, security ranges from sort of everything from search and rescue and safety at sea to environmental security and human security. 
Um, but of course, the uh, you know we would be naive and also wrong to to disregard the, the hard security issues at stake. But for us, I think that the most important thing is that we are great believers in in the multilateral process and in talking about issues. So we would always be in favour of of boosting um, regional and international cooperation on the Arctic. And you know, I think I think you know to try and mainstream Arctic issues in our contacts with a number of countries, not just the Arctic countries, but going beyond that, obviously China, India, even countries in, in the South are affected by what happens in the Arctic. So we need to bring Arctic questions and Arctic security questions into the mainstream, perhaps. Thank you very much. Very enlightening. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Um, I'll, I'll jump further uh, still online uh, and invite uh, Professor Taylor Fravel, who's the director of the Security Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, to step in now. Thank you very, very much, uh, Taylor, for being with us. Um, and we are back, basically, uh, to the question of China's role in the Arctic, which you have been kind enough uh, to promise to talk about. Uh, and the next five minutes are yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? We hear you clearly, and we see you clearly. It's a very beautiful picture. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate, and special thanks to the Danish Foreign Policy Council for pulling off uh, what seems to be an entirely seamless hybrid event, which I know is not uh, at all easy from, uh, in any sense. Um, so I want to talk briefly about China uh, and its approach to the Arctic. Uh, this draws on uh, research uh, that I've, I've been conducting with Lise Lotte Otgard and Catherine Lavelle, who are also participating uh, in today's event and uh, will hopefully be uh, published uh, very soon. But we try to answer the basic question is, how does a rising power like China with expanding interests sort of enter and engage uh, a new arena, in this case, uh, the Arctic, right? So, so it's a new entrant uh, to the Arctic, which means it will undoubtedly alter the region's dynamics. Whenever you have a major power, such as uh, China coming into a new area, it's going to have a substantial effect. But in particular, we want to sort of uh, understand uh, sort of uh, how uh, China's engagement will shape uh, patterns of conflict and cooperation in the Arctic. And uh, we also hope this will reveal how China uh, you know, will behave as a global power beyond the East Asian region, where, of course, it has very specific uh, issues in its own sovereignty that could lead to conflict. But beyond sort of the East Asian region, I think it's important to understand uh, what kind of a, a global power uh, China will be. And so we do this by focusing on how China has pursued uh, three domains or three functional areas in the Arctic, navigation, resource extraction, and uh, scientific uh, advancement. And so our main finding uh, from this research is that China pursues what you could call omnidirectional or a la carte engagement, picking and choosing uh, those avenues of cooperation uh, that maximizes its interests, either inside uh, the existing sort of regimes and institutions that are in the Arctic, uh, drawing on global institutions and regimes that are relevant to the Arctic, or working outside both of these in the area of bilateral cooperation. And so you know, China has, has a sort of a particular challenge it's trying to solve, I think, uh, with its engagement in the Arctic, which is it wants it to become what it describes itself as being a, quote, near Arctic power. Uh, there's this polar Silk Road, along with the 10 other Silk Roads that we now have. Uh, but, right, it, it, it's not sort of a resident sort of Arctic power. And, and so it has to figure out a way to uh, deepen engagement without necessarily alarming uh, those countries who are uh, native <clears throat> to the region. So in the few minutes I have left, let me just go very quickly through uh, these three areas, uh, starting with navigation. Uh, clearly, right, China has a significant interest here, as, as do much as the rest of the world in terms of access to these waters, uh, primarily for trade and commerce, potentially maybe far off into the future for military use, but I don't think in the short to medium term. Uh, and China's approach here is to use a global regime, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, to sort of uh, internationalize the Arctic, if you will, and justify and legitimate its presence as navigating as uh, as the UN Convention allows. And so this the, this sort of reference to the convention featured very prominently in China's uh, 2018 white paper. And sort of in the Q and A, we could talk about some of the differences, perhaps, with the South China Sea. But let's bracket that for the time being. Uh, I think going ahead, right, China is going to probably prioritize the Northern Sea Route, uh, and is also uh, sort of towards its end. I've been working bilaterally a little bit with Russia, investing in some transport infrastructure and, and in particular ports. But China also right, is not challenging Russian or Canadian requirements in terms of sort of access to waters over which those uh, Arctic states have uh, claimed and exercise uh, jurisdiction. 
I'm moving to, to resource extraction again. You know, China's interest here, I think, in some ways is uh, pretty straightforward. It wants to pursue Arctic development and, and gain access uh, to uh, the resources uh, that may uh, that, that may be available there. Uh, this sort of divides into sort of minerals and fisheries. I think let me talk mostly about minerals and hydrocarbons and things of that nature. Uh, because here the challenge is that these resources lie in waters that are under the jurisdiction of coastal states, right, including their exclusive economic zones and in some cases uh, extended continental shelves. And so this really sort of uh, has led China to pursue bilateral uh, cooperation with Arctic states in this area and really uh, focusing on FDI in Russia. The most notable investments here would be uh, in, in, in the Yamal gas field or, or the Arctic LNG2 project. China has been eyeing Greenland, as was discussed earlier, but I think has has uh, not only uh, sort of uh, faced kind of the U.S. response, but also I think decided not to uh, directly bring the growing rivalry with the United States into third countries in the Arctic and kind of make it a battleground in that state. So I think uh, China's shying away a little bit, perhaps from pursuing uh, some of those investments that might bring more alarm, which also brings, of course, China back to Russia with whom it has a very close relationship. In the area of fisheries, in terms of resource extraction, China has tried to pursue a more Arctic centric approach, uh, joining the Central Arctic Ocean Agreement, which was ratified by China earlier this year, which would really limit uh, the area in which China could fish. And so here, China has sort of paradoxically prioritized conservation, but in a way that I think uh, uh, generates uh, some uh, goodwill uh, in the Arctic. Finally, in terms of uh, scientific advancement, and this is sort of both in terms of Chinese interests, a means uh, and an end, right? As a means, it really does allow China to claim its status as a near Arctic power or near Arctic state. Science really has been the gateway into the Arctic um, for, for many countries, China in particular. And so this just by being engaged in this area, of course, um, it allows China to become more engaged in the Arctic more generally. But it's also an end, as was as, as was just discussed uh, by the previous panelists, right? Climate change is real. Its effects are going to be uh, profound. Uh, those will include effects on China. And so China has a stake in, in better understanding uh, how uh, the climate is evolving in the Arctic. Uh, China's approach here has really been regional. Uh, to work through sort of the existing institutions uh, that are in the Arctic for scientific advancement and then complementing that with pretty robust uh, sort of bilateral cooperation agreements uh, to pursue scientific cooperation with many Arctic states. Um, and, and that, again, really does allow China to sort of justify um, uh, its, its, its presence in, in the Arctic while also uh, contributing to better understanding the potential for climate change and how that, that might affect China. So sort of t taking a step back, I think what this is all mean, right, China has put in place, right, uh, sort of the foundation for a much greater role in the Arctic in the future, if that's something with, that it uh, would desire to pursue. I think sort of the jury is out yet. There are many other areas where, where China is focusing uh, it, it, its attention, but clearly it wants to have a stake in the Arctic. It wants to be a player in the Arctic. And I think in these three areas, it, it has pursued a, sort of a, a variety of ways of doing that, drawing on a global uh, regimes and institutions like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea for Navigation, uh, pursuing largely bilateral cooperation uh, in the area of resource extraction, and then uh, uh, the sort of uh, all, all sort of uh, all spectrum kind of approach in the area of scientific advancement. And so I think you know, China in that sense was probably a, sort of established itself as, 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 as what it wanted to be as a near Arctic state. And then of course we will have to see in the future um, how you know, global dynamics uh, involve and which one of these areas China might prioritize more in the future. So thanks again very much to the organizers. I look forward to the discussion and to any questions uh, anyone might have for me. Thank you so much. Professor Taylor Frammel from, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology just uh, uh, in a tremendous speed and, and with uh, great, great clarity uh, managed to explain China's interest in the Arctic brilliantly. Thank you so much for that. Uh, extremely helpful in this context uh, in, in, in Copenhagen. Thank you so much. And thank you for staying with us for the ongoing discussion. Um, in the interest of time, I will move directly uh, to the third uh, great power in the Arctic, namely Russia. Anybody who has looked at a map of the Arctic region will know that Russia is the great power uh, in the Arctic, um, a huge coastline towards the Arctic Ocean, an even larger land mass uh, in the Arctic. Uh, the greatest number of people in the Arctic uh, live in Russia, etc., etc. The greatest 
Arctic cities or in the Arctic part of Russia. Uh, so it's, it's very grateful uh, to welcome, I'm grateful to welcome Alexander uh, Seguning, professor at the Department of International Relations uh, at St. Petersburg State University, uh, speaking, of course, uh, about Russia's role in the Arctic, um, uh, a phenomenally important issue for us uh, to understand. So thank you very much, Alexander, for, for being with us. You and I have been together uh, on many occasions on a bus from Rovaniemi to Kirkenes and elsewhere. Um, so thank you very much for, for bringing memories back also. Uh, it's great to have you. Uh, and the next five minutes are yours. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, and thank you for a very warm introduction. Um, let me briefly outline a Russian Arctic strategy. But before I do that, uh, let me make a, a more general comment and a point which I already uh, did uh, or made uh, during the morning session. The point is that uh, contrary to what um, some Western analysts uh, uh, try to ascribe to Russia, Russia is not interested in a great power competition or confrontation uh, in the Arctic. And uh, uh, Russia uh, doesn't want any confrontation with anyone uh, in the Arctic. On the contrary, Russia is interested in uh, uh, Arctic as a peace, uh, peaceful and uh, stable uh, region, region of cooperation. This uh, strategic uh, purpose uh, is stated in uh, every uh, most important strategic documents uh, on the Arctic, including the, uh, two of them which were approved by President Putin um, last year. Uh, also, uh, uh, I would um, uh, uh, slightly disagree with the description of um, uh, what is going on in the Arctic as a military build-up. Uh, to my mind, uh, what is going on in, in, in the Arctic, uh, not only in Russia, but also in other Arctic states, is a military modernization programs, which are different from a military build-up. Uh, military modernization programs uh, are done by uh, all Arctic uh, countries because of the necessity to update, to renovate armed forces deployed uh, in this region. Uh, uh, as for Russia, for example, uh, there was a, a real degradation of Russian armed forces uh, in the Arctic uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So uh, there was a real collapse of the Russian military infrastructure uh, in the Arctic region. So the uh, strategic purpose of uh, 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 Russian military modernization programs uh, in, in the Arctic is not to build um, offens offensive capabilities comparable to what the Soviet Union had uh, in, in the Cold War period but just uh, to make uh, armed forces uh, more compact, better trained, better equipped, uh, more flexible and ready to meet not only traditional military uh, uh, challenges and threats, but also uh, challenges from soft security, non-traditional uh, uh, threats. Uh, and um, uh, just uh, to um, uh, underline this, uh, uh, this uh, point, uh, I would say that uh, just compare the uh, composition of Northern Fleet uh, on the peak of the Cold War and what we have now. Uh, on the peak of the Cold War, uh, the Northern Fleet had uh, um, 39 uh, nuclear submarines. What we have now, only eight strategic uh, submarines uh, and several uh, multi-purpose uh, nuclear uh, submarines. That's it. No comparison with the Cold War period. Uh, if you look at uh, the conventional component uh, of uh, Russian armed forces, uh, it's uh, much less than we had in the Cold War period. We, now we have only uh, three brigades on the Cold War Peninsula uh, instead of three divisions, which, which we had uh, in the Cold War uh, time. Uh, so I would say that um, uh, uh, it's uh, an of um, uh, of this trend. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, it's a so source of misperception uh, uh, concerning the strategic uh, purposes of uh, each other. Uh, uh, I, it, it is understandable that uh, it's a, uh, very much a result of the uh, Ukrainian crisis and the mistrust in uh, relations between Russia and the West um, in the wake of this crisis. But uh, uh, um, my point is that we shouldn't uh, make more, uh, create more mis misperceptions and stereotypes now. Okay, um, this was a comment um, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, Russian strategic intentions and purposes. 
Uh, now, just briefly about uh, the um, uh, uh, Russian Arctic strategy, uh, especially in the context of the Russian um, uh, chairmanship in the Arctic Council. Uh, as you might know, uh, uh, Russian Foreign Minister uh, Sergei Lavrov uh, identified uh, four uh, main priorities for Russian uh, Arctic uh, Council uh, chairmanship. The first one, uh, people of the Arctic, including indigenous peoples. Uh, uh, this is priority number one. Uh, and uh, what is different from uh, the previous uh, Russian um, uh, policies, uh, now uh, uh, Moscow would like to take care of not, not only uh, indigenous peoples, but also other people living uh, in the Arctic. Uh, uh, in, the, in the case of Russia, uh, we have uh, 2.3 million people living in the Arctic, and only uh, slightly more than 80,000 uh, indigenous peoples living there. So when Russian policy was focused only on the indigenous peoples, they tend to forget about uh, other people uh, who live there maybe their whole life. Uh, uh, the, the number of uh, people who are working in the Arctic on the shift basis is uh, relatively small. Uh, most of the population, uh, they live there on the permanent basis. So that kind of um, uh, priority uh, uh, obviously, uh, is a very important uh, change in, in the Russian uh, strategic thinking about the Arctic, because uh, uh, normally uh, human capital was uh, behind the economic uh, development or other uh, problems. Uh, then uh, the next priority is um, environmental protection, uh, including um, uh, uh, problems uh, related to the climate change, and uh, uh, Russia uh, is looking very much forward uh, to cooperate with the other Arctic countries in this uh, regard. Uh, and um, Russia welcomes uh, the United States uh, who are returning to the um, uh, Paris uh, uh, Agreement on uh, Climate Change, uh, from which it was drawn um, during the uh, Trump era. And uh, uh, Russia is ready to uh, undertake uh, all these measures uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, limit uh, greenhouse emissions and uh, other uh, measures to, to mitigate the climate change or, or adapt to climate change. Uh, Russia has its own, own national strategy on climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, uh, and uh, it's an uh, integral part of the, uh, this uh, Paris uh, agreement. Uh, at least the uh, uh, Russian uh, strategy uh, is uh, coordinated with, the, uh, with this um, uh, agreement. Uh, the next priority is, um, um, uh, is um, uh, um, sustainable uh, social and economic development. And uh, the focus is made, uh, first of all, uh, on, um, uh, on the creation of so-called circular economy. Uh, which is, uh, uh, first of all, friendly to the environment and uh, wouldn't bring more, um, more problems uh, to uh, this region. Uh, of course, it's a very um, uh, difficult uh, thing to do uh, because uh, most of uh, uh, existing Russian industries uh, in the region are quite, quite uh, old-fashioned, with the exception maybe with the LNG plant uh, on the Imal Peninsula. Uh, the rest of industries are inherited from the Soviet time, and uh, uh, to the date, the best contribution which uh, uh, Russia made in this sense is closure of uh, several uh, metallurgical uh, plants uh, in uh, Norilsk and uh, in Nikel, uh, nearby the Norwegian uh, border. Uh, and I guess this was a real measures uh, which improved the, the whole environmental situation uh, in the region, because these plants were the major pollutants uh, in the region. Um, but uh, also, uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, designed uh, a special uh, strategy for uh, social and economic development of the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, uh, which um, uh, make emphasis uh, on, uh, on the creation of uh, 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 environmentally friendly uh, extractive industries and also development of um, uh, uh, infrastructure, including uh, Arctic ship. Uh, Russia is a, a good citizen of the um, International Maritime Organization uh, and uh, implements uh, fully the Polar Code, uh, which was uh, uh, adopted by this uh, organization several years ago. And uh, um, I think it's a very important priority uh, uh, for, for Russia uh, to develop this uh, 
uh, clean, uh, almost clean uh, Arctic shipping. Uh, for example, uh, those um, LNG tankers uh, who bring LNG uh, to the uh, Asian and the European uh, customers, they uh, work on, on, uh, on LNG itself. So uh, Russia is trying to replace uh, heavy fuel with the light fuel, uh, which is uh, less detrimental to the um, fragile uh, Arctic environment. And finally, uh, the fourth uh, priority is uh, strengthening the Arctic Council. Uh, uh, Russia is very serious about uh, implementing this strategic plan, which was adopted at uh, the Reykjavik ministerial meeting, and uh, which is, I guess, uh, a very important achievement or accomplishment uh, by the Icelandic um, uh, chairmanship. Uh, and uh, uh, Russia also uh, would like to uh, strengthen uh, the uh, project support uh, facility. Uh, and next week, uh, there will be a meeting uh, in the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, where uh, our senior Arctic official, uh, Nikolai uh, Karchunov, uh, will advise uh, to the uh, Arctic experts and also with the uh, responsible um, Arctic ministries, um, agencies, uh, uh, to uh, suggest some concrete uh, projects uh, which should be uh, implemented uh, under, uh, under the auspices of the Arctic Council uh, during the Russian uh, presidency. And uh, to my uh, knowledge, uh, they plan to initiate uh, several dozens uh, projects, ranging from uh, uh, sustainable economic development to uh, um, uh, Arctic science diplomacy and uh, environmental uh, issues. So uh, I'm uh, pretty optimistic uh, about the future of, um, of the uh, uh, Arctic cooperation. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, uh, um, make an emphasis on this uh, great power competition. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's better to uh, look to the future with the hope than with the, the concerns. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, uh, for, for this comprehensive presentation of the priorities within the Arctic Council of, of, of your country, which of course holds the chairmanship presently. Um, now, one question, if, if you promise me a brief answer, because uh, we, we are under time constraints, but there is uh, let's say, um, a lot of questions arising from the ever closer economic cooperation between your country and China in the Arctic, noticeably uh, in the LNG projects uh, up in the Amal, uh, huge Chinese investments coming in, but also in the Northeast Passage uh, with huge Chinese interest there, pipelines being built to China, etc. Where does this lead? Is this a strategic partnership that's in the development in the Arctic, or how should we understand it? Please, uh, if you could answer this briefly. Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, it's another exaggeration and another stereotype uh, concerning uh, the Sino-Russian uh, cooperation. Uh, there were uh, great plans, uh, big plans uh, for this cooperation, but in reality, uh, they've never been fulfilled. Uh, what we have now uh, is only uh, cooperation around the Yamal LNG plant and the construction of the second LNG plant uh, again uh, on the Yamal Peninsula. And also uh, shipping this LNG uh, from Yamal Peninsula to China. That's it. Other plans, uh, uh, development of the northern sea route infrastructure, uh, uh, construction of railroads, uh, Chinese investment to the uh, uh, Russian Arctic mines, everything just was uh, the declarations which ne never been uh, implemented. So uh, the actual size of uh, Sino-Russian economic cooperation is very modest and reduced only to uh, this L uh, cooperation around LNG uh, pro production and uh, shipment. That's it. Thank you very much, and thank you for staying with us, uh, Professor Zagunin from St. Petersburg State University. I'll turn to uh, an issue close to the hearts of many uh, in this room, uh, that of Greenland and the thinking uh, of, the, um, of the people of Greenland, uh, of which, of course, uh, Sarah Olswe is our local expert uh, today. Sarah, as you all know, uh, was previously uh, a very, very central figure in Greenlandic politics. Uh, as well as in Danish uh, in the years that she spent in the Danish parliament. Um, presently uh, head of the Greenlandic Human Rights Council and uh, a writer of a PhD 
uh, at the University of Greenland, Ilis Matusafik, uh, on Greenland's relations uh, with the US. Uh, so Sarah Oswe, thank you very much. The next five minutes, you will tell us about how um, this uh, great power rivalry that we're not supposed to call it uh, is unfolding in your mind uh, and in, let's say, in Greenlandic thinking. Well, thank you, first of all, of course, for the invitation to, to today. I think uh, it has been a really, really interesting day so far, and, and also I've been looking forward to this uh, debate uh, and panel in, in uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, I've been wondering a bit where to start, because uh, I think that there's a, an issue with working on uh, or, or, or talking about the issue of great powers and their influence on a self-governing nation such as Greenland, that sometimes it is blind to the history that Greenland has gone through. And with that, I mean that uh, it's not new to Greenland or to Arctic peoples in general to see that there's an increase of tension among the great powers. Uh, it's an experience that, that Greenland and the political development in Greenland has carried with it for decades, coming from the Cold War or even before that, 40, 1941, this, uh, the, the first uh, defense agreement and later 1951, the second defense agreement and what that has, how that has impacted Greenland and the people of Greenland. So there are already experiences that are sort of the underlying foundation and basis of how Greenlandic politics are conducted also in these years and also in, uh, in, in regards to the question of, 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 of great power, whether you call it rivalry or, or competition. Um, and I think for a lot of Greenlandic politicians, that is a double-edged sword or it's an ambiguous thing. Uh, because on the one hand, the people of the Arctic particularly are very, very aware of where they live. Uh, very, very aware of how uh, increased tensions can affect the daily lives of peoples in the Arctic. Maybe more, for example, in the Arctic Russia than in Greenland. But because there are ties among the peoples of the Arctic, for example, through the Inuit, who both live in Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and sharing that history, being in contact, debating things through decades, these issues are not new for Greenland either, and not for the younger generation of politicians either. Um, so I think that, that that has to be taken into account when trying to analyze the reactions and the expressions that are out in the public from different shifting Greenlandic governments and including the current government. And I can't help but teasing you a little bit, Martin, um, because to try and, 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 and sort of communicate how it might feel sometimes to then be a small people in this, on this scene uh, I, I couldn't help but think that, you know, when, when walking up here, consciously on, or unconsciously, people tend to have an, uh, uh, to have an opinion on where the women, women should sit, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I admit to that. <laughs> and that is also what you experience as a small nation people or a self-governing people within a state or as an indigenous people. The ones with greater power tend to have an opinion on where you should sit, right? So that is what comes with being um, a politician in that setting. And I think that that is more something that you take into account when conducting your politics than it would be for the average Danish politician, for example, or the average US politician and so forth. So. I hope that that helped a little bit to understanding, and I'm sorry to, to tease you like that, uh, Martin. Um, but with that, I also want to jump over to talking about decision-making processes in the Arctic, because there we really do have a challenge. We have been talking about the uniqueness of the Arctic Council for many years to preserve the uniqueness of including indigenous peoples' organizations as permanent participants and so on, but the development in the Arctic is going in a direction where the many peoples, and 
there are more peoples in the Arctic than there are nation states, they all demand a seat at the table. So there's a big task in developing the Arctic and, you know, working around the whole issue of, of great power rivalry or competition that is about building a structure where the peoples of the Arctic are actually there and their voices heard. So it was mentioned shortly that I'm also currently a member of the Greenland Human Rights Council. And if you look at it human rights wise, a right, individual or collective, doesn't become less important just because it's fewer people that it's about, right? We have the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic right now. We have a debate in Greenland on how should we make sure that more people get the vaccine. Well, they already had the offer to get the vaccine, but could we then restrict them from going to bars and restaurants, and how does that affect their freedom rights? Oh, but it's only a few people. Yes, but they still have rights of freedom of, uh, of uh, gathering and, and, uh, and movement. So. Um, I think that there are some things here in the development where the Western world, or the great powers, if you may, um, if you want, that the thinking of how you involve in decision making, how you conduct the decision making, has to sort of go through a, 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 a what do you call it, evaluation, said mildly. Um, and then, just to tie some, I mean, the worries that you see among uh, Arctic peoples, including in Greenland, of course, then stems from what you have seen through history. I don't uh, find it particularly strange that citizens of the Arctic worry of an, an increase of tension in the Arctic. And I don't find it particularly strange either that citizens of the Arctic look around the world and see how it can go wrong in the international community when you only see some subject matter through the lens of security and military. You know, things go wrong, we see that. So, uh, th I think that there's a big need uh, to, to include uh, Arctic people, self-governing nations and so on in that whole uh, sphere in a way that, that, that is more equal than we see today. And I see some interesting development within the Kingdom of Denmark on that uh, area, but I also see some worrying developments in the world that can still affect that and make the power relations shift again. So I think I will end it there and, and, and there was some note on, on also the um, uh, uh, Arctic exceptionalism if it's ending. Um, I think that is another worrying thing for Arctic peoples because it's, it's the Arctic people's everyday life. It's not, not just a great power issue, uh, uh, but it's actually a, a, an everyday life. And in that sense, my last note is, would, is there a need for a reality check, for example, in the whole debate on uh, Chinese possible investments or the relation to Russia and how the US is also entering into Greenland in a wider sense, more diversified sense, to in, in these years, then only the, the, the need to be there because of the Thule Air Base. Um, because if you look at, for example, the uh, number of consulates and honorary consuls in Greenland, there's something like 17 of them, and there's no one from China. No. So, you know, reality check on what is actually on the ground in Greenland, it was mentioned briefly, and who do Greenland seek contact with? I see a very big wish to have um, uh, an increased contact to, for example, uh, the US more than others. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just one brief question. Uh, I think we all realize that the United States is not presently trying to buy Greenland. Uh, although, uh, Kenneth was very kind in describing uh, the increased interest, of course, security interest in Greenland uh, that Washington feels and, and, and uh, uh, operates. Uh, so, from your point of view, uh, I mentioned that you're writing a PhD about this, so, so I can't help asking you to give us just a very brief description of your perception. What exactly is the U.S. interest in Greenland, and how far are they willing to take it? Well, now I'm just only one year into a three-year project, so I don't, uh, I don't uh, sort of imagine that I have all of the answers to, to that kind of questions. But I think it was quite clear at the uh, Secretary Blinken visit to Greenland that there's a, a wish to, as I said, diversify, whether you see it from one or other side, the road into Greenland. Mm. 
So there has been this, uh, you can call traditional relationship between Greenland and the US that was based on a military presence in the Thule Air Base. And there's been a wish from a Greenlandic side to diversify that uh, relationship, and that is what is happening now. They spoke very much about people-to-people -people cooperation. They spoke very little about mineral resources and security issues. And also, I see that uh, I, my analysis is that both Greenland and the U.S. are very aware of what the self-government agreement says about which legislative areas Greenland can work on its own uh, terms on and which they cannot. Uh, and therefore, there are also very, specific, very much a specificity in what areas the U.S. wants to increase its uh, cooperation with Greenland on. It's not the areas where the Danish government can come and say, well, that's security, so you can't do that on your own, right? So I think that there's a quite clear uh, obviousness on, on what areas uh, th there's an expansion of, of collaboration on. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am particularly happy to introduce Rasmus Gilsup Adelson once again, Professor uh, of Northern Studies and Barents Chair in Politics at the UIT, the U Arctic University of Norway up in Tromsø. Um, the title of uh, Rasmus's presentation is Perspectives from Norway, Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Now I happen to know that Rasmus is Danish, but he actually <laughs> spent part of his youth in Iceland. So uh, very much indeed a multi-faceted uh, perspective. Uh, I'm personally looking forward to this, Rasmus. Uh, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and I hope everybody also off-site can hear me. Um, so uh, I'm a professor of international relations in Tromsø, and if you look at the Arctic in international relations, well, then basically you have to say that the Arctic has been a part of the international system for a very long time. And the Arctic has reflected the international system for the, a very long time. So the Napoleonic Wars, the Crimean War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, all affected the Arctic very much. So what happens in the international system is going to affect the Arctic very much today. And what is happening in the international system today? There are two things happening. One is that the post-Cold War unipolar moment is ending. So after the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, of course the United States was the sole superpower and the United States could largely shape the world as it wanted. And we can clearly see that's no longer the case uh, as we all see in Kabul these days. And therefore, we are moving towards a system, a much more bipolar system, where the world's two largest, by far largest national economies is, of course, the, the US economy and the Chinese economy. And also, if we look at the world history in a longer perspective, until the, sometime in the 1800s, Asia was more than half of the world economy. Asia is more than half the world's population, so it's natural that Asia is more than half the world's economy. And by around 2050, according to the Asian Development Bank in Manila, Asia will be more than half the world economy again. So we in the West, we have to come to terms with a future which looks very different, and it looks much less Western. Basically, look around you in this room, the future of the world doesn't look like this room. It's first going to be much more Asian, and then it's going to be much more African. I'm a guest professor in Paris right now, and if you want to see what the future is like, you just go around the Gare du Lest, and you can see it's young and it's African. And therefore, so when China is going to be one of the world's two largest economies, it doesn't matter it's China, when you're one of the world's two largest economies, you have interests and you have involvement everywhere, including the Arctic. The other big thing happening is that the post-Cold War is over concerning Russia. Russia is not the deeply broken society it was in the 1990s and early 2000s. Russia is returning as a much more normal great power and behaving as a normal great power. And we very often have conflicting interests with Russia and we don't share values, etc., etc. 
but we are back to a much more normal situation where Russia is a traditional Eurasian great power. And as uh, Martin mentioned, of course, Ar uh, Russia is by far the largest uh, Arctic country. So, um, and I am uh, normally in Tromsø in northern Norway, and of course, as I joke to American colleagues, we can see Russia from our house, of course, making fun of Sarah Palin. Uh, there's about 500 kilometers birds, uh, bird flight from Tromsø to Murmansk, and there's about 1,100 kilometers to Oslo. So that says something about how close we are to Russia. Um, so to very quickly go through the three societies uh, Martin mentioned, and I'm struck by that Norway, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland, in many ways, it's the old medieval Norwegian kingdom. So Norway, this Sino-American bipolar system and the return of Russia as great power, how does that look in Norway? Well, um, the US, Chinese, the US, Western, Chinese, Russian relationship, these things hang very well much together. So for example, the Chinese-Russian relationship is very much influenced by the Russian-Western relationship and the Chinese-Western relationship. And of course, we have a much, much worse relationship with Russia since the Ukraine crisis. And that means that, for example, in the Barents Sea in Murmansk, it's Chinese seismic vessels doing seismic exploration in the Russian Barents Sea today. It's not Western seismic vessels. Uh, we, of course, see a strong American strategic presence, submarines, uh, Arleigh Burke uh, destroyers, uh, B-1, B-52, uh, strategic bombers flying over the Barents Sea. If you look at Iceland, um, Iceland was a pioneer of Arctic relations with China. Iceland pioneered Nordic-Chinese Arctic science relations. Ar uh, uh, Iceland is the, first, um, is the first European country to have a free trade agreement with China. And of course, as the United States returns to the North Atlantic, the United States is de facto back at the Keflavik base, um, there will be much, much less space for Iceland to pursue its scientific, economic, etc., relations with China. The Faroe Islands, well, we just need to see, say Huawei. Uh, I'm sure you here in Copenhagen, you had first row seats to both the US and the Chinese ambassador's interest in the Faroe, in the Faroe Islands. Uh, so it's clear that the Faroe Islands was very much caught in this uh, uh, US-Chinese uh, competition over critical infrastructure. And concerning uh, the Faroe Islands and Russia, well, the Faroe Islands has a history of fisheries cooperation with the Soviet Union. Uh, Faroe East fisheries in the Barents Sea and uh, Soviet Russian fisheries around the Faroe Islands, and that, of course, continues. And then, of course, we all know the Faroe East uh, fish exports uh, to Russia as part of this whole uh, sanctions uh, play between Russia and the European Union. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, as always, to the point, uh, and also on time, uh, which is not always the case. Uh, no, because you have so much interesting to say. Uh, but now, ladies and gentlemen, we are left with exactly um, 25 minutes of question time, and that goes for all of you who are with us online as well. I urge you again, if you want to ask a question, you have to exit your full screen mode and you'll find a window in which you can add your question and Lisa Lotte will receive it right there on, on a laptop. So, the floor is open and I am first, uh, but otherwise I'll urge you to raise a hand, but I would like to remain, uh, return to our first speaker, Kenneth Weinstein from the Hudson Institute. Um, We've heard a lot now about climate change as the big game changer. And we heard a very specific um, point from Professor Sagunin in St. Petersburg urging us not to talk of rivalry and not to talk of militarization, but modernization in all of the Arctic countries. Do you buy that? 
I believe that uh, it's important to cooperate on climate change, certainly. Uh, on modernization, I view it as militarization. I mean, the, the modernization is so dramatic. It is, this is not uh, bringing diesel submarines. This is not, uh, this is, this is, a, this is, a, these are serious, high-end, high lethality, ultra-fast, next generation weaponry that's being uh, developed. And that's, that's why I view it as militarization. And so you would retain the, 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 the view that the modernization, the build up, whatever term we use of the Russian military, has essentially also, let's say, an offensive capacity that is there for a reason. Yes, I believe that it, uh, it obviously serves a defensive component, but it obviously has great offensive capacity. Then I, I'd like to return to you, Alexander, in St. Petersburg and ask you specifically about the Nagurskaya uh, air base up in, on St. Josefland, which is, of course, not a novelty. It was renovated from the old days, but it's certainly uh, a lot larger than it was back in the Cold War. Uh, and this has a specific impact on the security thinking in Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this specific base is closer than ever uh, for instance, to Thule Air Base, it, it has been renovated. It now has a several kilometers long runway. You can run bombers and whatnot from there. Uh, that particular base, does that also um, fit into the bracket of normalization of the military in the Arctic? Yeah, uh, let me start from um, uh, the point which um, uh, Kenneth uh, made. Uh, I already told that uh, we tend to forget about um, uh, the combination of strategic and conventional components uh, of, of Russian armed forces deployed to the Arctic. The strategic component has nothing to do with the Arctic military theater as a such. Uh, strategic component is a part of the uh, U.S.-Russian uh, uh, nuclear deterrence strategy. And the uh, uh, development of this strategic component um, is determined by this global rivalry rather than rivalry in, uh, in the Arctic itself. Traditionally, uh, two-thirds of uh, Russian um, nuclear submarines uh, are located on the Kola Peninsula. Another third is located in sub-Arctic area nearby Kamchatka uh, on the east. Uh, so um, uh, th these forces uh, are not designed for the uh, uh, action, for the activities in the Arctic itself. I mean, uh, uh, but conventional component is relatively small and, and uh, modest. Uh, as far as the strategic component is concerned, uh, I would say that um, uh, its development uh, uh, mostly determined by the uh, Russian counter-reaction, what the Republican administrations did. I mean, uh, George uh, uh, Bush, uh, George W. Bush Jr. and the Trump administration, they almost completely destroyed the arms control regime between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, only one uh, treaty, a strategic treaty, was left uh, uh, intact. But the rest was destroyed, uh, including uh, the uh, ABM treaty, anti-ballistic missile uh, uh, treaty, which was um, uh, a keystone uh, for the whole arms control regime. So uh, Russia simply had no choice to react or counter-react to the plans uh, uh, of the United States, uh, which were deploying new and new elements of the ballistic missile defense systems. So uh, all this weaponry, which uh, were listed uh, today, uh, it's a, uh, a means to overcome uh, U.S. Um, uh, ballistic missile defense system. Uh, so th that's, uh, in that sense, it's a, uh, not offensive. It's a defensive measure. Thank you. Of course, the military, military specialists, they can say that uh, uh, it could be dual use, but anyway. Uh, as far as Nagorsky uh, uh, base is concerned, uh, you're right, it's just a renovated uh, part of it. Uh, which uh, I mean, uh, uh, just uh, a necessary component uh, for operation of our Russian Air Force uh, in, in the region. Without that kind of uh, airfields, uh, you cannot uh, provide uh, Air Force with the uh, necessary infrastructure. But what was uh, added, it was um, a border guards station uh, on this uh, island, uh, and uh, uh, this is a completely new infrastructure. But it's, again, it's not designed for the offensive capabilities. 
uh, it's just uh, only to control the vast uh, maritime territories uh, around uh, this uh, archipelago. Uh, it's the border guards that are doing their job. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you very much, Alexander, for, for bringing the complexity also of, of the defense uh, of Russia into the picture here. Very important issue. Um, now, I could go on till Christmas. Uh, raise a hand if you have any thoughts you'd like to share or a question to ask anyone in the panel. This is a unique opportunity. There's a gentleman there, and, and if you'll wait just one second, you'll have a microphone. It's uh, COVID safe, so you will not get to hold it but you will get to speak into it uh, in just one second. Here she is. And if you'll introduce uh, yourself uh, and ask Thank you. Your... My name is Christian Raven. I'm, I'm just an interested Danish citizen with the experience of... I was a soldier during the cold part of the Cold War. Uh, it's a question for Michael Mann. Uh, uh, speaking about this new bipolar world, do you think that the EU are or will be ready to confront China or Chinese initiatives in the Arctic as itself and in particular to back up US strategies in that area? Thank you very much for a very distinct and precise and very relevant question to you, Michael. It's over to Brussels. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, tricky question. Um, basically, China, as I think some of the other speakers have said already, is obviously very present in the Arctic, but it's, it's doing it in a rather more softly, softly way, I'd say, than in other parts of the world. Obviously, they're investing heavily in, in Russian infrastructure and Russian energy projects. Uh, from my own experience in Iceland, I see that uh, China had a very big diplomatic presence there. They even had an ambassador who could speak Icelandic, which was an achievement in itself. Um, and so they, they are, and they've obviously got the, the polar silk road. I mean, we have a overall policy on China that goes well beyond uh, the Arctic. Clearly, we have to, um, you know, work with China in areas where that is possible. Uh, and I pick out climate change, for example, as one of those areas. I mean, they are getting a little bit closer to the ambitious targets that the European Union has set for climate uh, action. Um, but of course, we don't um, agree with China on, on a number of issues, particularly on the human rights side of things. Um, so, you know, I think our, it, it's a little bit early because I don't think the Chinese have really made their presence felt in the Arctic, to perhaps to the extent that some people think they have, and certainly not to the same extent they have in other parts of the world. So we will, you know, have to, have to see how things go. We cannot not cooperate with the Chinese uh, where it's in our own interests, but we of course have to bear in mind the overall uh, policy background that we have with the Chinese, which is where we are, we push back very strongly, for example, on, on issues of democracy and uh, on, you know, human rights and so forth. But, but all the time the Chinese are playing by global rules, um, we shouldn't, you know, get into conflict with them. I mean, one of the speakers mentioned the fisheries agreement in the Central Arctic Ocean. That was something where the Chinese did take longer than everyone else to sign up but, and to ratify, but at least they were on board. So I think we'll take a um, pragmatic um, but nonetheless principled stance. I think that's the way we, we try and operate always. Um, I mean, we have, our, we have our basic principles and our basic standards and our basic beliefs. And, you know, we will push back where they are in danger. But we have to, I think we have to confront the situation as it really is. And we haven't been directly, no one's been directly threatened by the Chinese in the Arctic thus far, as far as I can see. So I'd say a careful, principled, but pragmatic approach, probably. Thank you very much, Michael. And I'd like to push this further uh, to Professor Taylor Fravel at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who gave us this wonderful and clear uh, presentation of the main interests of China in the Arctic. I think that was uh, very lucid. Um, but I'd like you to, to also pursue this issue of the um, underlying um, perceptions of China's uh, let's say, more hidden interest in the Arctic, the more strategic interest, perhaps, uh, and enlighten us on, on your own opinions on this. 
because what you mentioned, uh, the three main I items uh, were in, in China's interest were navigation, resources, and science, all of which I think most people would agree are uh, at least superficially very legitimate interest of a nation of 1.45 billion people. Um, so why should we worry when China pursues legitimate interests in the Arctic, uh, Professor Taylor? Great. Um, thanks very much. So uh, I think. Whoops. Story of my life. You're on mute. Um, uh, sorry, here I am. Um, no, I think as you hinted at the start of your question, right, there's this concern that China has uh, you know, ulterior motives beyond sort of the ones that we discussed. One uh, you know, area where you could look at this would be to, uh, I mean, you could think uh, that China wants to pursue a divide and conquer strategy in the Arctic, right, to somehow sort of weaken NATO or weaken Europe. And so it's, it's pursuing all of these bilateral relationships and deepening its presence to enable it to pursue that kind of a strategy in the future. I don't think China has decided to do that, but one could perhaps uh, uh, conclude from sort of China's greater presence, it would be more able to do that if it wanted to. More specifically, uh, on the strategic side, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not China would uh, want to deploy uh, uh, ballistic missile submarines uh, to the Arctic. Uh, this is really uh, almost the most prominent strategic issue uh, that is mentioned. I'm somewhat skeptical of that for a number of reasons. Um, uh, first, right, China doesn't have a good submarine, uh, uh, right? Its current ballistic missile submarine is noisy. It's easy for the United States to track and destroy if necessary. Um, so it would need a new submarine, most likely. Um, the United States itself, due to sort of the geography and hydrography and just the challenges of navigating under the ice, right, uh, apparently didn't really deploy SSBNs on deterrent patrols to the Arctic. It did deploy smaller attack submarines to the Arctic to hunt Soviet ballistic missile submarines. Uh, then China has this challenge where if it wants to you know, send ballistic missile submarines up into the Arctic, it has to go you know, um, uh, through this sort of choke point um, and, uh, you know, in, in the Bering Strait around St. Lawrence Island adjacent to Alaska, where the U.S., uh, you know, has a long history of tracking Soviet submarines and has the, some infrastructure in place to do that. And so I think, you know, it's just the sort of direct military use in that sense, I think, uh, is going to be quite challenging for China when it has other uh, alternatives. And so, uh, in that very sort of specific and sort of the ultimate strategic sense, I don't think necessarily that is uh, uh, the direction in which China will be heading. Uh, as we've seen recently in terms of its nuclear arsenal, uh, China's decided to sort of to build out um, uh, uh, silo-based uh, missiles uh, on its homeland territory, which I think is in fact perhaps a reflection of, of its own assessment of the weakness of its ballistic missile submarines. Um, uh, which in many ways would be better for survivability, but since China's are not survivable um, today, especially against the United States, that's not an option. So I think one can view it, you know, sort of the latent challenge as being diplomatic, kind of a divide and conquer strategy uh, to gain more influence over uh, countries that are more firmly uh, part of NATO or part of Europe or part of the West as a way then uh, to sort of to weaken the West in the future. But then, you know, China has challenges in pursuing this strategy too in the Arctic, because if it's not uh, what Arctic states want to do. Uh, and if China is still working through these kind of institutions primarily, or if it has to have pursue this, as Michael mentioned, softly, softly approach that I kind of laid out, um, then, then it's going to sort of very rapidly create a counterbalancing coalition. And then finally, I don't think the Arctic is uh, sort of the, China, the most important region to China in the short to medium term, because even even the commercial uh, navigation issues are probably not going to be highly salient until there's much greater climate change and, and, and much greater accessibility to these waters uh, on a regular basis. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions on my list, and then I can't help um, bothering uh, one of the participants here, uh, because I can see in the very back of the room uh, Member of Parliament, Aya Chemnitz Larsen from Green Greenland, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I know you've been here all along, um, of course I can see you from here. Um, and, and I want to change the subject in a little while uh, to that of climate change. I, I think we all recognize the magnitude of the changes happening in the Arctic, or at least we're trying to uh, absorb the speed with which it's happening. It's, it's uh, 
From some point of view, it's devastating. From others, perhaps there are opportunities here. But I'd like you, if possible, if you could give us your perspective as to, not right now, but, but I just wanted to prepare Aya that I, for one, is, is, is really hoping that you will take part uh, on that specific topic. Right now, we have a question from somebody who's not here physically, but Lisa Lotte will relay the, uh, the question from cyberspace. Yeah. Uh, it's for Professor Frabel, and the question is, do you see the interest between China and Russia in terms of Arctic matters can be compatible as they strengthen its bilateral cooperation? Uh-huh. Did you get that? Taylor Frabel? There was a question. Yes, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear from our, our Russian uh, colleague as well on this. Um, but I guess my quick take would be, uh, like clearly, obviously, China and Russia have grown much closer in terms of their uh, global uh, diplomatic uh, and strategic cooperation. But of course, there are many um, sort of potential sort of fissures or fractures that could be exploited. And here, of course, uh, one in the Arctic might be uh, whether or not China wants to continue to sort of abide by Russian jurisdictional claims as the ice melts and, and, and sort of access uh, to these areas that Russia has traditionally uh, to the waters that Russia has traditionally exercised um, extra jurisdiction over for, uh, under the, the rationale of sort of safety of navigation changes and, and, and China sort of wants to pursue a more independent posture. But for the time being, I think China and Russia uh, certainly uh, see uh, many uh, common interests that unite them and bring them together. And so I suspect they will be able to continue to downplay the potential uh, points of friction uh, in the short to medium term. Thank you, Taylor Fravel. And there's a question right here in the center. Yeah, OK. My name is Taylor Bauman. Um, I have a question for uh, Kenneth Weinstein and for Michael Mann. Uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg uh, likes to remind us that during the Cold War, Norway pulled off the trick of confrontation with uh, the Soviet Union on one hand and an understanding with, uh, with the Soviet Union up in the, um, in the Arctic area on one hand. He, he, on the other hand, he said he, these two could be managed together. Now, my question is this. The U.S., can the U.S. decouple an Arctic policy from tensions with China, say, in the South China Sea. And the EU, can EU decouple the Arctic um, uh, question from the Ukraine in, in its handling of, of Russia? What I mean, what, I, what I'm thinking of is, is the handling of uh, the Arctic question is that dependent on Arctic factors alone or on confrontations elsewhere? And if it is dependent on confrontation elsewhere, where does that leave uh, the indigenous people? Where does that leave, uh, leave the people of Greenland to, to participate in, in, in shaping an Arctic policy? Thank you very much. I think that was fairly straightforward, Kenneth. Well, look, I, 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 obviously, I think a, a big chunk of Arctic questions have to be dealt with as Arctic questions. And the question becomes, where does the spillover start and what, and, and, and what should be done about it? But uh, uh, and so that means cl climate change issues. Uh, certainly, this administration will want to, the Biden administration will want to work with Russia to the extent that it can. Uh, I think that there, there you know, but, the, but the question becomes when security concerns arise, how, how do you understand that and, and, and how do you view it and what do you do in turn? And so that's, that's the sort of <coughs> spillover effect that you see. Uh, but, there's, but cooperation in the Arctic still remains fundamental to U.S. policy. Thank you. Michael Mann? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. It's a very interesting question. Um, obviously, the European Union's relationship with Russia is very much coloured by the Ukraine thing. And we, we have a set of principles, that what we call the five principles, which govern our cooperation or not with, with Russia. Um, however, the 
you know, it, it, what is important to say, I think, is that the, the Arctic, as well as, for example, let's say the Iran nuclear talks, the Arctic is an area where we can still work with Russia uh, according to these principles that we have, uh, where it is of, of, of mutual benefit, where it's a benefit to us. And, and, a, and a particular example I would pick out is uh, what we call the Northern Dimension Policy Framework in, in, in the Arctic, which basically uh, primarily deals with environmental issues. So we are uh, helping to clean up uh, legacy nuclear waste from Soviet times. We're helping to clean water. We're helping to cut down on black carbon alongside Russia and, and assisted also by our other partners. And because it is of interest not only to ourselves, but also more, more globally, we don't want uh, spent fuel from nuclear submarines spilling out into the Barents Sea and destroying fisheries, for example. So there are opportunities to work with Russia um, in, in the Arctic context but again, we have to stick very closely to the to the basic principles that uh, that, are, that have applied since the invasion of uh, Crimea and the uh, and the problems in Ukraine. Uh, but but you know, the, if you look at the Russian program for the the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, it's very much in principle along the lines that we believe are the uh, the priority areas for the Arctic as well. So, and and I would also underline that whatever tensions people may be. Uh, imagining are there, Arctic exceptionalism does remain the norm. I mean, we still do cooperate generally uh, across the board in, within the Arctic, whether it be in the Arctic Council or the Barents Euro Arctic Council or the Northern Dimension. There is a good level of cooperation still, and our major interest is to keep that the case. Thank you very much, Michael, and, and we're etching very fast uh, closer to our coffee break. I don't know whether I managed to mobilize uh, interest from Aya Chemnitz. Um, but uh, if we move the microphone down there, we'll see whether th I had any success. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, not to bother you at all, um, but please, uh, yes, give us your take on... Uh, my question was, uh, what does climate change mean for all that we're talking about here, security and Greenland's uh, position in all this uh, great power uh, play in the Arctic? First of all, I just wanted to say the question that the gentleman came with uh, was very interesting. I actually brought it up in the Foreign Affairs Council in, uh, in Folketinget, in the Danish Parliament, and I had a discussion with the Prime Minister here in, in Denmark on, you know, what's going on in the EU? Does it have a negative spillover effect when it comes to the Arctic? Uh, because I think Russia, they have different foreign affairs politics depending on where in the world we're talking about. Is it the Arctic? Is it Crimea? Is it towards uh, other regions? Um, but could there be some kind of spillover effect when it comes to the Arctic? I think it's a very good question, and I don't necessarily think that we have the answer for it. So it's, it's something that I think Michael Mann EU, but also within the realm, it's something that we need to talk much more about. It's an internal political discussion that I think is important to have. So just a comment on that first. When it comes to climate change, uh, first of all, I think it's important to say we have a new government in Greenland, uh, which is IALET, and uh, the government is in the process of looking into signing the Paris Agreement, which I think is amazing. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, but, but I think, of course, climate change is, uh, is something that's affecting Greenland very much. We have, we have never had as much rain as we have had this summer, for example, there's a lot of, you know, changes in the climate, but also a lot of opportunities coming with the climate change in Greenland. And just the fact that um, more land is uh, being exposed and, and the fact that there is more um, resources that are being exposed makes it even more interesting. Uh, so there's no, you know, it's, it's, it's a fact that the cli climate change is really something that's affecting the great powers' interest in, in Greenland, uh, and it's just increasing. I don't think we have seen uh, the highest um, of interest from, from these great powers yet. Neither do I. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have come to the conclusion of this particular panel. Um, I would like you to be back after the coffee break here at 2 let me check before I say this. No, at 4.15, of course, for 
uh, a second brilliant panel at 4.15. We will reconvene here, but before you leave, help me thanking uh, not only Kenneth uh, from, for traveling all the way from the US, uh, but also to uh, you traveling from wherever you came from when you came here. You're always somewhere different. Uh, and to all the other panelists uh, who have spent time with us and effort and their uh, important uh, thinking. So thank you to all of you out there, Michael, Taylor, Alexander. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us here in Copenhagen. Thank you to everybody who was streaming this conference. And please stay tuned. We'll be back in about 20 minutes at uh, 4.15 Danish time. Thank you so much, all of you. Give them a hand. Yeah, Vena. Dear friends, if you would find a seat, potentially, possibly the one you had before, thank you very much. We will continue into our second panel, and if you were in doubt, there is also a third panel. Uh, a little later in the afternoon, we will deal with environment, mineral extraction uh, uh, in, in, in the last panel. But right now, um, we will deal with, let's say, a slightly more um, technical issue, if you could call it that, the role of the defense industry in the Arctic. Um, this, of course, is of, of, of crucial interest to all who are interested in the Arctic. We all know the very specific and, and, and very um, broad role that the, uh, that the vessels uh, of, of, of a state nature, the, the gray, green, brown um, naval vessels, they play in the Arctic um, and, and the rest of the defense industry, not only in, in, a, in a hard security matter, but also in many other different aspects of uh, of the Arctic developments, whether it's uh, science, uh, whether it's uh, Coast Guard, uh, soft security, um, the armies, the Coast Guards play a, a very central role in everything we're talking about in the Arctic. And so does all those who provide um, this hardware uh, and software nowadays. Uh, so this is about the defense industry and its role in the Arctic. We have four speakers. The <coughs> format is the same as we used previously. Um, and in a second, I'll introduce our first speaker, but I'll leave that uh, for last uh, because he is not here. He is with us, uh, as you can see, on a uh, link from uh, Anchorage, uh, the, uh, the state capital of Alaska. I'll get to him in a second. But just very briefly, uh, I'll come back to all the three gentlemen here. Uh, furthest from me, uh, Kim Jesper Jørgensen, the former head of the Arctic Command in, in Nuuk and presently head of uh, the institution uh, very famously known as the Defense Acquisition and Logistics Organization. In Danish, Forsvarsministeriet's uh, Materiel og Inkøbs Styrelse. No, Tjeneste Styrelse? Correct. Styrelse. Styrelse, yes. Uh, very simple and easy. Uh, Understood. Um, the point is, he takes care of half the defense budget of this kingdom. Kåre Gros Christiansen, CEO of Odense Maritime, builds ships. And yes, Mong Hansen, CEO and president of TAMA AS, a global supplier uh, to the defense, aerospace, and security markets. Uh, for now, um, I would like uh, to welcome uh, very much Randy Church Key, Executive Director of the Arctic Domain Awareness Center at the University of Alaska. He's also a member of the U.S. Research, uh, Arctic Research Commission, a hugely important uh, institution in the U.S. Uh, but here I think uh, we should uh, appreciate most of all uh, Randy Church um, role as, uh, as director of a hugely important institution in, 
in Alaska, the Arctic Domain Awareness Center. Um, he's much more also a global fellow at the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center, uh, a, a hugely knowledgeable person when it comes to Arctic um, uh, affairs. So Randy Church, um, we thank you once again to be with us. Uh, Randy was also with us earlier this morning and, and you should appreciate that the time over there is very much different from our time. So uh, Randy has basically not been to bed uh, tonight. Uh, so thank you very much uh, again for being with us. And please, the next five minutes, Randy, are yours. Uh, the title of your intervention here is Trends in the U.S. Arctic Strategy. It's all yours. Thank you so very much. So just make sure you can hear me okay, sir. We hear you very clearly, it's distinct and nice, and the picture is sharp and bright. Great. Well, good morning uh, to you from my zip code. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to you in your zip code. It's a privilege to be online with you. I am so sorry that I'm out there in person with you. I'm, I hope and pray that the evilness of COVID will one day be just a distant memory, and being together will be a normal occurrence once again, as opposed to the virtual experience. The aspects of trends in U.S. Arctic strategy is uh, I'm going to take principally a more of a defense and security look, but it's in context of an overall view, which includes, of course, economic, climate, environment, uh, certainly looking at the aspects of security risks, challenges, and cooperation opportunities, and ultimately seeking desired end states, which, of course, for the United States remains, has been the case for a number of years, the peaceful opening of the Arctic region and where regional cooperation is uh, really continues to bolster the Arctic exceptionalism that many have in the, in the Arctic region know as standard. The aspect of Arctic strategy, of course, has been a very focused area within the security and defense spaces, uh, quite remarkably distinct from other regions. And the aspect of the national strategy for the Arctic region, which was promulgated in May of 2013, was a watershed moment for the United States in really categorizing the Arctic uh, as a major area of interest for the United States. Again, focus on those aspects of economic, climate, environment, security risks, and ultimately seeking the desired end states. Coupling with that at the same time frame, the United States Coast Guard promulgated an Arctic strategy literally on the very same day in May of 2013 that really emphasized the very unique role that the United States Coast Guard plays in the Arctic region for the United States. It does project sovereign influence on the, on the, surf, on the surface of the region and the maritime spaces. It also provides an, an incredible intersection between security forces and the community of science. When you look at the aspects of today, uh, there has been a very recent number of Department of Defense strategies that have been promulgated. Each department has now a new Arctic strategy for that particular uh, Department of Military Service. It includes the Department of the Air Force, the Department of the Navy, the Department of the Army, and the United States Coast Guard within the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security both have also released Arctic strategies of their own. Each of these focuses on the challenges and opportunities and the roles each of these departments play in advancing overall U.S. sovereign interest and ultimately identifying the security risks, challenges, and ultimately mechanisms for implementation that reduce those risks and increase the sovereign influence, again, consistent with U.S. national interests. These new strategies, of course, are all in the business of also seeking implementation plans. And implementation plans are trying to reduce the gap between say and do. In this aspect, when it comes to security dimension, there is, of course, the aspects of hard power, but of course, necessary goes with this, the business of soft power to complement, to hopefully reduce the chance that we have to result to, resort to hard power uh, solutions. In this context, of course, the United States, has this, as an Arctic nation, has the state of Alaska as its, uh, as its salient into the Arctic region. The United States is an Arctic nation because of the state of Alaska. And Alaska, of course, is a place that houses, uh, for the United States, the largest number of fifth generation fighters of any particular region in, in the United States, whether in the, in the continental US or anywhere overseas. Again, more fifth generation fighters here than anywhere else. That's just one aspect. The United States Army is now putting together new formations 
uh, into the Arctic region and, fo and focusing its efforts where it had previously over the last 10, 15 years, it principally used Alaska as a garrison to train and, and deploy from to other regions of the world. Now there's a concerted effort to train and regain our uh, ability to survive and thrive and, and, and really be quite fluent in Arctic operations per se. Is doing this not uh, in an aspect of militarization, but doing this aspect of securing our sovereign interests in this particular region. There's so much more to talk. I hope I have the chance to, uh, to cover this in uh, the Q&A portion, but those are some opening reflections. And let me just close with this last remark. In the aspect of the Arctic, the United States, of course, recognizes not only the aspects of the sovereign state mindset here, but also the rising influence of, of, the, of the voice of the self-determination across the region. It is increasingly a complex region that has interplay between sovereign interests of, of nations, but also of community groups. And lastly, of course, the changing climate in this region is changing far faster than even in most recent estimates had anticipated. So these, of course, make it a very complex region where environment drives an awful lot of activity, but also do so do our national sovereign interests. So I give the floor back to you, sir, and thanks for the chance for these reflections. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just one question before uh, we, we go on to the people physically here. Uh, the issue of domain awareness um, has been very topical, very much present in all security talks over the last years in the Arctic. Uh, and, and we know of the, de de the desire of, of Washington for an increased uh, domain awareness also in, let's say, the area of the Danish Kingdom, in, in particular over Greenland, the Gill Gap, and the Faroe Islands. Um, technologically speaking, uh, what exactly would you prioritize if you were to uh, advise or, or simply enter into the discussion on this issue what will be the next step? What is most needed? What should be prioritized when it comes to increasing domain awareness uh, in the kingdom uh, of Denmark? Well, thank you for that opportunity. And this is, a, forgive me in advance, this is a huge area of passion for me. So I, I will be very restrained, uh, but please know that I'm bubbling, uh, ready to expound on this quite a bit longer. Uh, but in sum, and then you, you tell me how much longer you want to go, Strategically, it's about sensing. So we have, there is a, a lack, of course, because the polar regions uh, all exist uh, outside essentially the area where geosynchronous orbits can have a, a long steering look. It's a really relied on, on, from a satellite basis, of polar orbiting in order to get some amount of, of really, you know, lasting influence of understanding the region, of awareness and understanding what's happening on the ground across the polar regions, again, outside of geosynchronous orbits. So because of it, you know, it's a combination need of sensing the environment and sensing the region. That includes, of course, polar orbiting satellites. It also includes, of course, um, air breathing platforms because, again, uh, polar orbits are there episodically. They don't take a long stare on the region. And so it's a combination of polar and terrestrial and air breathing but again, sensing the region and complementing that, of course, the need for communications. Uh, it is a area where positioning, navigation, timing is lacking because simply it's outside the geosync orbits. And so that's what I begin to start with. Again, so much more to discuss. I start with that as, a, as an opening cell phone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I will just simply go on as I'm supposed to. I, I was going to ask one more question. I won't. Kim Jesper Johansen. Um, as I said, for five years, head of the Arctic Command in Nuuk, um, and also before that, actually the planner uh, of, of what was going to happen up there. That's a long story. And, and now back in, in Denmark, of course, as head of the, uh, the uh, very easily named uh, Defense Acquisition and Logistics Organization <coughs> of the <coughs> Ministry of, of Defense. Um, it's all yours. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll make it easy. I just buy stuff. I buy uh, equipment for Danish defense, uh, including, of course, for Arctic uh, operations. And the title of, of the intervention here is An Operational View on the Need for Capabilities. And, of course, that is based on a combination of my present job and the five fantastic years I spent in, uh, in Greenland. Um, first of all, when uh, considering what capabilities are actually needed 
fighting operations. It's vital to have a look at the actual conditions in the area, in the region, where you're going to do operations. And conditions are very different from one part of the Arctic to another. And of course, my reference is primarily Greenland. And Greenland is characterized by extreme beauty, but also by extreme distances and very limited civilian infrastructure, as there is a very limited civilian population in large areas. For instance, if you look at northeast Greenland, size-wise, it's the same as France and Germany combined, but the population in that area is zero. There is no population there. So therefore, generally, there is no civilian infrastructure or sources of supply that can support your operations. So an important lesson when talking about Arctic capabilities and Arctic operations is that it's all about logistics. It's all about logistics. So when buying equipment or doing operations, you have to remember that you have to bring all your supplies, all your logistics with you. And by logistics, I mean everything. I mean the means of transportation. I mean food, fuel, medical support, etc. Besides logistics, it's all about communications. The ability of units and headquarters to talk to each other and exchange information. There is seldom a significant civilian communications infrastructure that can support you. And uh, as was alluded to in the previous intervention, most satellites uh, can't even reach that far high north. So a precondition for every activity in the area is, besides logistics, the provision of long-range communications equipment. Then in order to do a meaningful operation, you need to know what is going on, uh, what the situation is on the ground, in the air, and at sea. You need surveillance capabilities. I'm talking about a combination of some of the capabilities that was mentioned by the previous speaker. I mean, surveillance satellites, preferably radar-equipped surveillance satellites, Fixed-wing surveillance planes, they can be manned or unmanned. Uh, ships, ground-based radars, helicopters, and patrols on the ground. And on the ground, I'm talking about Arctic Special Forces. All these sources of information have to be combined into one operating picture. And here the term multi-domain is very important. You have to use and combine surveillance assets from all the domains land, air, sea, and space in one coordinated operation. And by the way, that is exactly one of the roles of the Antarctic Command in Greenland, which I consider an example of how to do multi-domain operations. Then in order to execute operations, meaning in order to react to anything unusual detected by your multi-domain surveillance, you need a combination of units. And often, it's the same type of units I just mentioned for surveillance purposes. It can be uh, naval ships, in many cases, ice reinforced, aircraft, helicopters, and again, special forces. And all of it, of course, enabled by logistics and communications. One last experience I like to relate here is that um, when doing the planning and execution of Arctic operations, it's important to live in the area to live as part of the local population. It has many advantages, including learning for the local population how to actually live and work under the conditions in the area. And also being able to coordinate the surveillance with the population and with the local authorities. And the population and local authorities, for instance, police, fire brigades, or even tax authorities, they actually have a lot of knowledge about what is going on in the area including activities that can perhaps not be detected or understood from a satellite. So in my opinion, it's important that the headquarters controlling the operation has to be in the area of operations, living among the population you are serving and protecting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, just one question, um, or perhaps several. Um, um, we, as a nation, have recently spent a tremendous amount of money buying a new generation of fighter jets. How helpful will they be in the Arctic? 
they can be extremely helpful, I can assure you. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, the specific fighter model we're buying is actually equipped for IC runway operations, meaning uh, we're buying a slightly modified version with a brake parachute so they can operate on IC runways. Norway and Denmark does that. And uh, if we're going to use uh, our new fighters in the area, that's entirely a political question. Yeah. But if the desire is there, they are perfectly suited for Arctic operations. And as was mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, the US Air Force, US Air National Guard, they use a lot of fighters of this type in Alaska. So we see the proof every day that they can be used. Now, as you uh, very diplomatically say, this is of course hugely uh, political because there are people in the world who would perceive the use of Danish fighter jets up there as, as very, uh, let's say, uh, not useful in, in the context of maintaining the Arctic as a peaceful uh, region. But from a logistical point of, of view of, of very fast machines that can cover huge distances in a very short time with a lot of sensors attached to them, uh, they would be helpful in, let's say, in achieving some of the goals that, that we are discussing here. I was talking about surveillance. And modern fighter aircraft are perfect surveillance platforms with radars and other types of sensors. So yes, it doesn't have to be uh, fighting and killing all the time. Fighter aircraft are actually excellent surveillance platforms. Interesting. Um, let's leave it at that for the moment. There are no politicians uh, present in this panel. Carl uh, Gros Christiansen, CEO of Odense Maritime, a shipbuilder. Um, in the large league. Um, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you very and, much. And sorry, I should say, there is a title here, Trends in the Future Maritime Platforms of the Arctic. Thanks a lot. Actually, uh, we are the spin-off for a company from the Ebe Mola Mosk owned uh, Odense Steel Shipyard. So we actually don't build ships anymore, but we, we design ships around the world for, for a lot of countries. We are, um, uh, we have designed a lot of container ships. That's why logistics, demand for logistics is something we have worked a lot with in designing container ships. We've also designed the, um, the Danish frigates and we are, have designed the, uh, the Arctic offshore patrol vessels that is operated by the Royal Danish Navy, but also recently the ship being built in Canada right now that will operate in the, in the Canadian part of the Arctic. Now, uh, this company is based on that something we learned when we were part of the Abel Miller Mosh Group to, to design and build fast. We could, we could design a new platform and build a new ship in, in, uh, or design in 18 months. And that is something that, um, that we struggle with around in NATO that sometimes it takes 18 years to, to build a new new or design a new platform. But that's not the case in China. In China, they have actually adopted quickly. In, uh, they're also very, very efficient in designing and building ships and is now the global leader in not just building, but also designing. But back to the uh, topic here. Um, uh, we have pretty much our hands around designing ships that can operate in, in, uh, in polar waters and in Arctic waters. We are more focused now on what exactly is it that these ships can do. And that's why we're listening carefully when, uh, with, uh, when this gentleman is talking. Uh, because we can't use the same thinking that we're using when we're building or designing ships for the Baltic. We need to have another mindset when we design for the, uh, for the Arctic. Um, so what's, so what's, what do we have on the mind? Um, as, um, as was said, we probably, or we need to bring all the infrastructure along. How, how does that translate into the future ships? We need to have a big deck where we can basically uh, manage those drones that should go up there. Also manage those uh, unmanned surface vessels that we need to send out on the sea. And probably also equipment that we need to send, send uh, uh, underwater. So, so we are foreseeing that the future platforms will be kind of motherships that will be the, uh, the, uh, the hotspot or the home port for, uh, for some of those surveillance and sensor systems that we, put, that we need to put on the ship to, to do what, what, uh, what is needed. 
We also believe that the future of world, that we can't design ships that can only just do one task because the area is too vast. So we need to, uh, we need to design platforms that can, that can quickly uh, change uh, role so that we have an, uh, basically can bring along the technology that is needed in that particular case. Now, in the container ships, we have two types of containers, cargo containers and reefer containers. What we imagine in the future is that we will, we will need to build and design ships that can accommodate a, a, bigger, um, a big catalog of different containers uh, containers that can carry energy, containers that can produce energy, containers that can produce water, containers that can contain a hospital, and I could continue. That's the kind of, um, of flexibility we need to build into the, uh, the future ships that can operate. So we're not talking about ships that can carry 18,000 containers, but we're talking about ships that can carry a lot of smart containers that can do a lot of interesting things. And why do we need to think about that and how can we predict the future? We can't. But the problem with ships is that you have to, they, have to, they tend to stick around for 30 to 40 years. So, so, we, have to, so we have to imagine and, and listen and try to, to create these ship platforms as flexible as possible so that they also can deliver value in the region 20 years from now. Thank you. Um, our government, just a few days ago, issued a new uh, defense strategy. Um, and part of that, as far as I understand, is to secure a greater amount of national um, sufficiency, self-sufficiency in military supplies in the future. I imagine, and you confirmed for me earlier today that that is, uh, let's say, not a bad thing for uh, your company. Um, how will it help, um, let's say, in the, in the future in the Arctic? Well, uh, such a strategy where a government basically uh, t take the long glasses on and, um, and write down what is the strategy in the future will allow a company like ours to, to, to basically start planning based on that strategy. So we, can, so we can start to recruit people, we can, we can, we can tell the young people that, that, um, that if you uh, go, oh, I want to be an engineer, you can basically, uh, 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 or will get a role in converting that strategy into reality. And there will be skilled people and bright people needed to convert strategies and when the PowerPoint meets, re or meets reality, that's where you need people that can turn it into, um, into solutions. So, so it's great to have a strategy because that allows a company like mine to, to plan and to recruit and to develop uh, the solutions that are needed. Right, and, and, and that takes time, it takes innovation, it takes thinking, it takes bright people, as you say, and China has a hundred times more of all of that. So if, if we continue from, from the previous panel, the, the, just for, for a few seconds thinking of, let's say, competition uh, in the future, uh, also in the Arctic, will the, let's say, our, our usual thinking of Western technology as uh, better, faster, smarter, um, how far does that go, this perception, when we're talking um, maritime platforms uh, for future use in the Arctic, does that compare with that of China? Uh, or how does it look? Yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm uh, uh, concerned about because, I mean, you don't become good at something just by coincidence. You become good at something when you practice. And we practice a lot earlier in designing ships. We did it every 18 months. Now, we don't practice a lot in, in the NATO community right now. We, we are too slow in developing new things. China is not. They are, are really strong in, in developing uh, new products and bringing them to sea. And it might not be that they have that submarine we talked about in the previous session, but they will build 
ships that can do seismic in the Arctic. They will build cru small cruise ships that can take people to the Arctic. They will be good in developing these products. Uh, and they will gradually get experience with, with ships that can operate. In and the in the commercial field, will they be able, will they be able to do the, the, the the steel, the, the ice strength in the container oh. ships that is needed in, in the Northeast Passage on the polar route in the future? Oh, they've already done that. The, uh, the latest container ship we designed for Maersk was built in China. And that Maersk container ship actually went, went on the northern route. So it's not a question of if they can, they, they can just do it. So, so, um, so for China to, uh, to create the ships and the, you could say the commercial platforms that can operate in, in the Arctic is just a matter of if they decide to do it. And what is the strategic answer from the industry in our part of the world to that challenge? Um, we, we need to uh, work smarter together. Uh, we need to, uh, to re uh, to unite our our thinking, and we we are we are doing that when we collaborate and work with Canada and U.S. and we are designing uh, frigates for U.K. right now. Um, and when we do such projects, we also keep up that momentum in designing uh, ships. We also do it on European level, so we are also part of um, of some uh, some research on on European level where we are trying to find out what are the future technologies and, and our part of that little game is to find out what is the technologies that, is, that are needed to, uh, to operate in harsh environments like, like the Arctic. And, and we were giving that leadership because we had that experience in, in, in designing those ships yeah. in the past. Thank you very much for now. Uh, yes, Monk Hansen, CEO and President of Tama AS, uh, as I said, a global supplier to the uh, defense, aerospace, security markets, um, the largest of its kind, I believe, uh, in this kingdom, at least. Um, yes, uh, you have agreed to speak about trends in air and space technologies in the Arctic. Next five minutes are yours. Thank you. And I'll speak a little bit beyond that, uh, because I would like to challenge a few paradigms uh, today. Let me, just a few words about Terma. Uh, we are active in the defense industry, but also in many civilian applications. We um, work with different materials, we work with electronics, and nowadays a lot with uh, software, uh, like many others. When it comes to the Arctic, uh, we have been involved in developing satellites uh, for the European space agencies. Satellites that get used to measure, for instance, uh, ice thickness, uh, monitor movements of ice, etc. Uh, more conventional technologies uh, in the Arctic is uh, our, sat well, our radars, you probably know us from, uh, that are, uh, of course, in, in, in the Danish areas, in Greenland, but also in Canada. And then we have developed the software uh, that basically is the control system of, of the Danish ships. Just to give you some ideas that we'll work with. And then we are a major supplier to the F-35, and I'll, I'll challenge your paradigm on that in a second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me take two steps back. I want to elaborate a little bit on what Kim said. When we develop technology uh, for both the civilian and the military uh, in the Arctic, it's very different than to develop for any other place in the world. Uh, you heard the last few hours about the political complexities. Uh, that's also uh, difficult for us to find out sometimes exactly who to work with. Um, but it's also the harsh environment, uh, of course, that requires that our equipment get tested uh, early on. And there, in Denmark, have a fantastic platform uh, in that Kim and his colleagues have maybe one of the best, uh, uh, you can say, overall experiences on how to operate cross-domain, as Kim uh, talks about, in the Arctic. And the Danish armed forces are exceptionally good working together with Danish industries. Uh, to allow us to test equipment, whether or not it's civil or um, military equipment. So that's one of the ways we can compete, and frankly, I think we're better at that uh, than uh, many other countries. But you have to remember that the Arctic is completely different. It's not like anything you uh, have seen before, and we sometimes forget that when we discuss politics or solutions. Uh, there are many things I, I can uh, stress about uh, what is different. Uh, the one I want to stress here is like Kim said, the big distances between 
uh, what in his world is called assets. What's an asset? An asset is a ship, or it's a, you know, it's a radar, or it's a plane, or it can also be a civil uh, vessel. That, that's an asset. There's a tendency in the past that we looked at these assets a little bit isolated. The Air Force was the Air Force, the Navy was the Navy, uh, but already uh, in Denmark, I don't know how many years ago, came, uh, you decided to look at it as, as one. So a much more holistic approach because you don't have the luxury of calling in somebody else. Everyone has to be able to, to help each other. That in the physical world, uh, how, how can we dramatically improve our presence? Uh, situational awareness that the, the first speaker was talking about is absolutely key to know what's going on and how to react. Uh, both of the speakers talked about that uh, earlier. It is about connecting these assets. Uh, how do we make these different, and I will talk software, and I'm sorry if it gets a little bit nerdy, these data points? How do we share when there's a radar sitting somewhere that collects tons of data? How do we provide that data in to the ships, how do we provide that data up to the planes, and how do we see a, a larger and better picture together. Today it's very limited what we can do. We're not very good at sharing the data across our platforms. And this is the first paradigm I want to uh, challenge. It's not only about military platforms, it's all, also about civilian platforms. Whether or not it's cargo ships or if it's SAS taking off uh, from Castrop and flying to, to Chicago, they fly right over the Arctic. Um, they actually generate data in, the self, in themselves, just to take a very simple and straightforward uh, example, but something we discussed yesterday, when that SAS plane is flying over the Arctic, there is no link up against our systems, neither in monitoring that plane, nor in maybe helping collecting data. And that could easily be provided. Nowadays, and I'll introduce a few technical terms, what we, we do also in many other places in the world, Tama, is we bring a lot of data uh, together in something called data fusion. You, you have to imagine that you put a lot of data uh, into one database. Uh, you have, I'm sure you heard the term uh, big data, uh, when a very large uh, amounts of data. And then we overlay that uh, with something called artificial intelligence, uh, which is software that can make sense out of all this data. And now it's a little bit mathematically, but the more you add to it, exponentially your understanding of the world around you get better. So it's inherently important to connect all these data po points and to work together. It sounds incredibly easy and it's actually not that hard technically. Um, uh, what's hard is the paradigm. Because we are not used to working across platforms. We're not used to, uh, at, well I just said in Denmark we're fairly used to it. But I want to challenge that we need to become much better at doing that not just as a country, but also in the alliances that we have, where we don't do that a lot, and at times also with parties that are not in our alliance. Uh, particularly for search and rescue missions, for scientific missions, we have to share data to a much larger degree to understand uh, what happens to the environment uh, in the Arctic, but also to be able to get the situational awareness uh, that the first speaker uh, was talking about before. And these are very difficult paradigms politically to take down. And I'm sure you know from the discussions in Denmark about just the data that get collected on all of us in the healthcare system, where we also have a really difficult discussion about should we allow pharmaceutical companies to do data mining on that. This is a little bit a parallel, but just in the, you can say, in a very, very different domain. But the mathematics or the technology behind this is, is basically the same. So it's a, it's a paradigm we have to break down of how we work together. But when we do it, we will get a dramatic improvement of our understanding uh, of what's going on and, and, and how to utilize also existing assets. Now I want to you know, bring up your F-35 comment. And, and with a risk of offending or standing on somebody's toes further down here in the room, I sometimes say the F-35 is not a fighter jet. It's not a fighter jet, it's a flying sensor. There is, it is one of the most, if not the most advanced sensor in the world. What that plane can pick up of data is flabbergasting. Uh, I don't even have access uh, to understanding its full uh, extent of what it could do. But there's no reason, and that's my personal opinion, to limit that to military application. Mm. Those flying sensors can easily be used to monitor all kinds of traffic, and are also being used for that, 
but also for more scientific uh, research. Um, and, and that's another paradigm. If we see it as a fighter jet, by the way, the F-35 prefers much not to fight. It will let somebody else do it because it would like to fly stealth and it will let somebody else do the fighting. Uh, it's way too expensive a platform to, to, to do that. If it need be, I'm sure it will do it. But the point is, don't see it as a fighter. See it as a sensor. And that is what is so special. And in Denmark, we have to find out how to use that new capability, uh, whether or not it's in the Arctic or other places. So there are beautiful technologies out there uh, that can be usually helpful, uh, not just military, but also uh, for science, uh, for civil traffic. Um, and and uh, we, we have the technologies to put it all together, make it all work together. But it requires a very different thinking uh, from our decision makers. Uh, both in the country, but particularly across countries and, and across uh, our alliances. Uh, but uh, I'm sure we can uh, get that done. Thank you very much. Very intriguing. Uh, and as you can tell, it's not only technical, it's also potentially quite controversial, uh, what we're talking about here. Maybe we should stress at this point, there is no decision by any uh, Danish government uh, to, uh, let's say, move the F-35s into the Arctic. This is purely speculation at, at, at this time, uh, just to make that clear. Um, now, the, I, I have a question to you, Kim, just for clarification. Right now, as we speak, uh, what is actually possible when it comes to communications, uh, the moving of data between the different um, assets, as we call it now, uh, troops on the ground, ships in the waters, planes in the air, uh, in Greenland? You have, uh, <clears throat> you have two means of communications. One is the old-fashioned high-frequency radio. Um, it has uh, an extremely long range, but the bandwidth, the amount of data you can transport, is very limited. So you can basically talk to each other or send short messages, like a text message. But you can't transmit, for instance, a video sequence or something like that. In order to do that, you have to use the other means of communications that we use, and that is satellite communications. And there, we are best at using satellite communications in the southern part of the Greenland area and around the Faroe Islands, due to the fact that Satellites, most satellites have a tendency to circulate around the Earth down at the equator. And therefore, when you're up high north, that area is not covered by the satellites. For that, you need a new generation of polar orbiting satellites, which we're, of course, looking into to see if we can acquire their services. And basically speaking, am I right in assuming that we are still at a stage where nobody really knows, there is no full picture of traffic in the Greenlandic airspace. That's correct. This is amazing. I mean, we're, this is 2021, and we don't know what goes on in the airspace above Greenland. Does what? this, I, I, I was going to ask a very rhetorical question. This worries uh, people in NATO, in Washington, in Copenhagen, uh, this is an issue that has been worked on for years, uh, not the least by Kim himself. Uh, improvements are being made. Uh, an investment of 1.5 billion Danish is being made presently to improve some of this. So it's not as if nothing is happening, but that is an issue. It definitely is. Seen from a, an operational perspective, a user perspective, this is, of course, not an ideal situation. But actually, that has been recognized by the Danish government and by a majority in parliament. Because as you rightly point out, as part of this additional fund for Arctic capabilities decided earlier this year, um, a major part of that is actually an investment in beginning to close this radar gap. And that is by reestablishing a radar station on the Faroe Islands. Yeah. And when it comes to the rest of the area, what we can do right now is cooperation with our allies and partners, our neighbors, for instance, Iceland, Canada, because there are raiders in Iceland, there are raiders in Canada, and we can cooperate and exchange whatever information we have with them.
thereby yeah. improving our overall awareness. I, I bring this fact of, of the, the uh, difficulty of, of monitoring the huge airspace in the Arctic, of course, to, to stress the need for, for improvements and the innovation that we're talking about here. And I, I would like to re return to you, uh, Church, in, in, in Anchorage. Uh, there is a, a, a suggestion here of much more data sharing and, and basically cooperation uh, that can be improved in, in many different fields. Uh, we know things have been happening very fast in this field uh, for some years, but, but uh, I'd like to ask you to, uh, to bring us your view on this. How could we uh, expect uh, or ask for cooperation to increase uh, more rapidly in the Arctic when it comes to data sharing uh, and other initiatives that might uh, help uh, close the gaps? Well, thank you. Uh, let me just offer a couple of thoughts here because ultimately um, many of the remarks made by General Jorgensen, uh, I can echo, but strategically uh, as far as the technology aspects. Uh, the reality is today that, uh, for example, the United States and Canada have a very strong binational relationship that called North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, and really NORAD since the 1950s has been in the business of getting domain awareness and understanding of the North American Arctic, which is for, from an Alaskan and Canadian vantage point, starting with the dew line in the 1950s and then the North Warning System in the 1980s. There's a lot of work right now to create NORAD Next, uh, which would be uh, a, a new North Warning System approach, which has been in discussion for a number of years. But at the end of the day, a series of radars is one aspect. A series of sensing satellites that are polar orbiting, whether they're defense or government owned and also leveraging commercial satellites that are now being put in the region quite, uh, putting in polar orbiting satellites uh, are being established on the commercial side quite substantially now and in the near term. Because strategically there is an awful lot of need for uh, communications and this is something that on the, uh, from both commercial and also from uh, the, the, the defense and security side Sharing between those two, leveraging commercial investments, is not a, not a bad thing. Information sharing among the members of the alliance is critical. A user-defined operational picture that really integrates uh, the information gained from air breathing platforms, uh, autonomous platforms, and really this is one aspect that we have not dwelt much upon. Uh, autonomous platforms can so much uh, outpace the, the limits of human endurance when you look at the fact that submarines, uh, small vessels, I'll say submarines in, in a very small autonomous motor system, for example, our center, our, cent, our center here has been developing a propeller-driven long-range AUV that can operate as low as, as little as uh, two meters of water down to about 600 meters of water, and that just be able to characterize the marine environment, but do so for, instead of for two or three days at a time, for two to three weeks at a time. And again, getting that information back to enable the decision maker, again, is critical. Enabling the decision makers in across a network based on alliances and partnerships is critical. Sharing information from authoritative data sources, many times it's not a matter of technology. It's a matter of gatekeepers lifting the gate to allow the flow of information. And back to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, one more question to you. Um, there is a suggestion here, of course, from, from Jens Monk Hansen, as you heard, uh, of much more data sharing and how helpful that could be. Uh, I, I have met people in, in Greenland uh, very closely um, in need or, or very badly in need of more information of this and that. Um, and there is, a, there is an idea that much of this information is available from Tule Airbase because they got antennas all over the place and, and whatnot, uh, but they don't share. Uh, do you see a potential for really deep data sharing between the U.S. military and the Danish military in this field? Well, absolutely. First of all, we're NATO allies. So as NATO allies, frankly, it's a matter of has, has the Kingdom of Denmark and the United States sat down and say, here's, here's what we have to offer, here's what our information needs are. Allies are in the business of taking care of each other. I'm an arduent fan of, and believer of the value of NATO and the NATO, and, and it's not only, of course, an alliance of 30. It's really the binational relationships. And simply as fellow Arctic nations that are part of an alliance, I think that perspective is critical. Sharing information is, is so very, very important to enable your decision makers 
and the same in this aspect of mutual agreement, mutual interest, and of course mutual needs. So the answer I respectfully believe, not representative, not representing the U.S. government in this matter, but I do believe that that is possible, and I do believe, frankly, that is needed. Thank you very much. I'm, I should stop myself once in a while. We have time, and please raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Um, it's most, most welcome at this time. Uh, so any questions, there is one here, please, in the front line. Rasmus Bertelsen, as, as you have met before. Uh, yes, I have a simple question to Kim Jonsson. Uh, any Danish F-35s in the Arctic, where would they operate from and what would be their range? What area would they cover? Thank you. <laughs> as this is purely hypothetical, <laughs> as there is definitely no decision on using F-35s in the Arctic, I will point out that there are actually three uh, well-suited bases in the Arctic. Two lay base, Gangers Lusovak, Sønder Stromfjord, and uh, Kefelvik on Iceland. And Kefelvik is actually well positioned because it covers the <coughs> eastern approach to parts of Greenland. So there are possible places to uh, position fighters. When we talk about the uh, size of the area versus the classified range of the aircraft, it will of course be an advantage to have tanker support air-to-air -air refueling in order to do it, do it in an effective way. Otherwise, you could still do the mission just in a smaller area. Yes, please, in the very, very back, um, part of the organizing team behind this conference, if you'll introduce yourself, please. My name is Nils Wang. Yeah, I'm a, a managing director of Naval Team Denmark. Thank you very much for enlightening us on a very interesting topic. My question is for uh, the one who buys the stuff, Kim. Uh, and that is basically, um, now that we are looking into the replacement of the Danish patrol frigates, which is approaching their 40th birthday, um, how do you see the prioritization of uh, surveillance, air surveillance on those platforms because it seems to me that the mobility uh, could be a good combination if, uh, if, uh, if you have some of your radar capabilities also on, on those platforms. Could you elaborate a little bit on your thoughts on that? Uh, maybe with the reservations that nothing has been decided politically yet? Thank you. Again, a hypothetical answer at least. Uh, just a word for background. Uh, the Royal Danish Navy operates four Arctic patrol frigates uh, used in, in the Arctic area. And uh, before long, they'll have to be replaced by a new class of ships. And uh, Danish Defense is uh, right now very actively looking to define what capabilities are needed on that replacement class. But uh, if I then uh, revert back to uh, my operational past, and then uh, I would say that we would definitely, as operators, love to have air surveillance capabilities on board those ships, because that can be used to pluck some of the holes in the air surveillance. And uh, as long as you have data connectivity, meaning typically satellite communications, then you can send that radar surveillance picture to anywhere where it is processed. So among a number of capabilities that is definitely wanted aboard the new ships, air surveillance is one of them. I can confirm that. Thank you. We are very rapidly running out of time in this panel. Um, but yes, just ask for the floor. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to come back to your uh, question I answered, Cole, about the new Danish strategy for um, uh, defense industry. And, and how that can help in, in this context. I, I, I think it's a good strategy. It's good that has, it's been a good, good dialogue, frankly, uh, between uh, Danish industry, various academic institutions, um, and, and various ministries. And I think really what we're looking at there is also trying to identify what is of, you could say, national security interest. What, what is important that can be, need to be maintained as a skill in Denmark? I think the ships, is my personal opinion, but of course also somewhat biased with what I do, 
um, because the ships are such an important platform in the Arctic. It, it, it's, it's, it can be moved around. We just talked about the sensors and Nils asked about, but it's also more than a ship, again, a paradigm shift. Those ships are much more than, than the classic sensor ship. It's a logistic hub you can use basically to operate from. And then there's the, the, the data again. I want to get back to that because that's going to be so dominating. And again, think about the discussions that are in the Danish healthcare system about use of data. The same applies when it comes to military discussions. We as a nation and other nations do need to understand what their data is used for. Mm. Um, uh, I welcome also from where I sit, the more sharing on, on the macro level between nations. But also in Denmark alone, there's a lot we can do. And I bring in the universities again. They have a lot of data from their research. We have the you know, DME, uh, we have uh, the fishing industry. We have all kinds of access to data. So it doesn't always have to be on the very, very high macro level where we have to involve NATO. And, and, and there's a lot we can do ourselves. And that is critical in the strategy, that we as a country can manage confidential data, that we can mine it, that we can come to conclusions so we know what's going on um, uh, at the time we want to know what's going on. Uh, that, that's going to be very interesting the next few years to define what that actually means, and that's part of the new uh, strategy. So. Thank you. Cor, a last word before I close this panel? Um, well, no. no, I think that pretty much, um, I think that statement from yes here would um, be a fine ending of this. Yes. Excellent. Randy Church in Anchorage, Thank you so much for staying up all night uh, to be with us here in Copenhagen uh, today. That was wonderful of you. We wish you were here, uh, but having you on a screen is almost as good. Thank you so much, and thank you to the three gentlemen who are here uh, in person. Thanks for a very enlightening session, and uh, give them a hand, please. <laughs>
the dilemmas of the environment and resource extraction, the dilemmas that are um, uh, posed there. And I thought a good way to think about it would be to think about it through the lens of this Wilson Center report on climate fragility. I, I like the way the report talks about the notion when we think about the environment of actorless risks. So these new risks that come in the emerging world environment that aren't necessarily attached to a state or a group or an industry. So it's a, an entirely new area and it's one that's particularly pertinent for the Arctic. So if we think about the environmental side of it for, uh, for a, a minute, because we're, we're moving along here at the end of a long day, um, when we think about melt, uh, melting ice in the Arctic, it poses three major threats that are specific to the region. And these threats create new ecosystem dynamics. So there isn't um, one way or one actor to attach to what's going on, and there certainly isn't agreement about what to do about it. So if we look at the first of these, it would obviously be the melting ice sheet in, in Greenland. And the reason that this poses a unique, a distinctive kind of environmental threat is due to the rising sea levels that have the potential to displace up to 187 million people. Uh, the second uh, of these uh, types of risks that is specific to the region uh, has to do with the permafrost thaw. Uh, thaw. Um, the permafrost, uh, the melting permafrost poses uh, risks that are more immediate to the area where the infrastructure, where it occurs, but it's also a global threat because of the viruses and um, the other um, gas emissions that come about it. So it creates a public health threat. And I, I think we've all had a public health threat in the last 18 months that I don't need to elaborate on that. And the third element has to do with the collapse of the Gulf Stream and the potential that that has to cause a drought in Central Europe. And so these are very significant threats, clearly, but we said there's two sides of this equation. So what do we see on the resource extraction side? Well, obviously, we, it, it, the thing that hits any, any observer of the Arctic, and we certainly heard about this all day, are the considerable uh, resources to be extracted there. 30 billion barrels of oil, depending on how much uh, is, is estimated, or roughly 13% of the remaining uh, resources on the Earth. Uh, the significant um, LNG uh, resources that the Russian economy desperately needs to sustain itself. And then again, as we've talked about throughout the day, the rare minerals that are in the Arctic that um, are meeting rising demand because they're needed for electronics that um, so many of us have certainly come to, I couldn't use mine, but I've had to learn in the pandemic. So like, if I wanna tell people about this who, who don't understand the dynamics in the region, I would say if you wanna visually what's going on, uh, view what goes on at Arctic, the Arctic Circle Assembly, I, I know many of you have been there, but for people who haven't, um, you see people or groups or interests that desperately want to see these new navigation routes and places to open up and see the new opportunities that are created by this. And at the same conferences and the same panel, there's environmentalists trying to stop it because of the sense that it's going to kill us faster. And so it, it, there's obviously a, a conundrum there. And at a minimum, the world community needs to continue a degree of resource extraction, how much and how fast that takes place is a question, but we need to... Whoops. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. <laughs> no, I'm back. Okay, so even if all it is doing is helping us to transition to using um, uh, renewables, renewable energy, so to get at a resolution of uh, this dilemma, um, in our research, at least the, the research that we've done as a result of our project uh, connected to the conference, um, we've argued that some sort of club of great powers is needed, but we need to have a moral and a normative foundation uh, to that club in order to compel states to act or to incentivize them to act. And so this normative consensus would be expected for those of us who are international relations scholars that would be expected to be reflected in international law and organizations. But perhaps newer forms are needed. I think one of the exciting things that we've seen with the Arctic Circle is certainly the inclusion of a broader group of participants. And here I'm talking about the representation of 
um, indigenous peoples, which is, is just a great advance and has been used as a model, I'm sure you all know, for other international organizations. And I believe the new governor, direct, since we don't have a Canadian, I, if, if we do, I haven't heard them all day. I believe the new governor uh, 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 general of, uh, of Canada is, was instrumental in that with the Arctic Circle. So that's very exciting for all of us. But um, we know that there's a political dilemma because there isn't agreement even within a country, uh, democratic or otherwise. Um, earlier today, when, when people were talking about Russia, um, our, our Russian colleague isn't here. My own understanding of scholarship on uh, Russian environmentalism is that it's really difficult to generalize, either across industries, forestry, LNG, whatever it is, it varies dramatically across industries. But obviously, due to the immense size and, and Russia as a continental power, it, um, there, there are regional differences depending on whether or not the environment is managed for Moscow or whether or not it's managed at the local level. So um, it's really difficult to see one, one picture emerge of, of our Russian colleagues, certainly in the United States because of the, the Alaska um, not being um, contiguous with the other, they, they were lesser, someone told me this week, we're not the lower 49, we're the lesser 49. Those of us who live in places like Ohio, um, sometimes people are surprised when I tell them that the United States is even an Arctic power. So anyway, at the end of the day, you can have a laugh about that. But anyway, these political dilemmas are there because there isn't this agreement um, or about the need to respond. So our research has emphasized the importance of forging a normative consensus around environmental standards. And what we've also tried to do is look for places where there are mutual economic interests between uh, resource extractive industries and environmental protection, at least in order to get things going and to uh, get the, take steps and acknowledge the competition and the contest among these players um, in this in an arena that has no one player that can be addressed internationally because they are actorless. The, the causes are actorless. And to do this, we need to bring together three elements. So in foreign policy, obviously the military, we've heard a lot about that today. Also, we know from studies of international relations, economic is very important, and that's what we're talking about. But also the third part of the new triad would be environmental and to incorporate this into how we understand the foreign policies of all of the states in the world and, and not just in the Arctic. So I, I appreciate everyone who is still here at the end of the day, and I really look forward to the discussion that, that we will have about the issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much also for uh, this enlightening uh, uh, introduction to the lack of a normative consensus uh, on these issues in the Arctic. Uh, I think this has been fairly evident for some years that, uh, for instance, Russia pursuing uh, fossil fuels uh, very uh, intensively in Norway as well, uh, whereas the Greenlandic government has just uh, uh, introduced legislation banning uranium mining and, and basically said, no, we will not have oil exploration or extraction in Greenland. Uh, very much diverse set of views in the Arctic. You have your Alaskan uh, oil industry, of course, uh, and all that that entails. So thank you very much for that, uh, for the time being. And, and if I can make a quick comment about that. I Please. think the views of indigenous people are very important because of their notion of science and, and a different notion that's more localized, but that's also necessary to enter into this. So in the Alaska example, we haven't talked about the Alaska Native corporations that have very interesting ways forward with respect to how to balance some of these challenges that arise between resource extraction and uh, climate change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, Sarah Alsvi, who is here with us in Copenhagen from Greenland, of course, has, has raised the issue cont con continuously today of what exactly is sustainability in an Arctic context. And perhaps Mini Grosing will address this now, professor, as I said, of geology uh, at the University of Copenhagen, well known also from the academic community in Nuuk. Um, the university there and, and science in Greenland in, in, in general. Uh, Munich, you have promised to, told, to tell us what you think are the key issues of mineral, mineral extraction in the Arctic today. Well, I, I think I will start a, a little bit at a different place and maybe because we are so late in the day and it is hot and no oxygen left, whatever. So a little wake up call. So I think instead of calling it uh, the dynamics of a changing Arctic, we might uh, start calling it the dynamics of a disappearing Arctic. Mm. I think we're actually looking into possibly losing the Arctic by its climatic definition altogether within this, uh, this uh, century, if, uh, if things go on as they do. 
So I think that is the gravity of, of, the, of the situation we are, we are looking into. And that, of course, uh, then uh, brings us to another uh, question, and that is uh, what uh, we, we, we are discussing a lot of very important issues here, and uh, we are looking for answers, but we haven't quite discussed what is the out what our objective is actually, what is the outcome we wish to obtain. And I think that uh, part of the discussion has been uh, more about how do we maintain control over the Arctic rather than our, about how do we save the Arctic as such and how do we make, make, you know, maintain the Arctic as a place to live and to provide good uh, services for the global community. Uh, so it's much about the political, uh, um, you could say, control of the region that we are discussing. And I think, uh, of course, uh, politics uh, operate in a different space from science, which, uh, which I usually uh, swim around in. And that is, of course, politics work on perceptions rather than facts. So I think maybe it's a good idea to also look a little bit about what is the perception of the Arctic uh, from a global perspective. And I think it's actually there's quite large differences and they are what may be one of the reasons why we have difficulty aligning our objectives and our means uh, when <laughs> collaborating across the Arctic. I think traditionally the Nordic countries have seen the Arctic as part of home. It is part of our realm, it is part of our natural interest sphere, and it's part, there's people of all the uh, Nordic nations more or less live in the Arctic. So for us, it is not a remote, strange uh, place. Whereas in the broader European and American and maybe uh, the rest of the world, basically, the Arctic has traditionally, uh, you know, less than 100 years ago, been seen as an invincible, extremely difficult, impenetrable barrier for, say, transport from Asia to Europe or North America. It was a place that people talk about fighting the Arctic. It was a force that was so strong that, you know, calloused, uh, heroic men lost their lives in the battle to get through the Arctic and, into, uh, and, 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 and find ways to get through it. So it was never sought as a living space. It was sought as a barrier that prevented us from getting stuff we wanted, either from Asia or from within Arctic itself, whale oil, fish, whatever. Um, and then uh, gradually over this uh, past century, uh, we have seen a shift uh, uh, from a, uh, looking at the Arctic as something that was in the way of our interest towards you know, getting our, this, the stuff we wanted. The Arctic had changed a little bit to be a frontier from which uh, we could start to develop uh, and expand our spheres into the Arctic. Uh, so it's, it, it, it basically changed from being, again, a barrier to being an opportunity. And I think uh, that we are, have now changed again uh, due to the big climate uh, uh, disaster that, that we, are, we are in the midst of, that we are now talking to talk, uh, starting to talk about uh, the uh, fragile Arctic environment. We talk about the Arctic as a victim that has to be protected from us, whereas less than 100 years ago, it was some force we had to fight. And I think that that is, is very important for uh, managing our uh, actions in the Arctic to understand our own perception of it and how they have changed. And you have all seen, I mean, when I was in, in my time as, a, as an active person in Greenland, growing up in Greenland, being a young man in Greenland, I would never ever have questioned when I was 25 to go out and shoot a polar bear at the first opportunity I would have. And now you would, I mean, you couldn't even think of it. Uh, now, at that time, a polar bear was a fierce animal that you had to fear and better get rid of as soon as you could. And now it's a poor victim that sits on a little ice floe and, and bites its nails. And uh, so, you know, so, so again, I think perception is really important and, 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 and our objectives should be clear. Um, so, back to your uh, original question, what about these extractive uh, commodities that we can get out of the Arctic? First of all, I think, again, they, uh, that viewpoint um, basically explains that, that, uh, that perception of the Arctic. When we talk about extractive, that is what we mean. We want to bring wealth out of the Arctic and into our homes. Uh, so we're not talking about how do we create wealth within the Arctic. We talk about how do we get wealth out of the Arctic. Uh, and I think that is, that is uh, that's also important. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just that we need to be clear of what we are talking about. And um, when you come to then what is the reality and what are the possible uh, uh, values that can be extracted from the Arctic region, uh, we have all been through, say, 10, 15 years now of uh, 
great expectations for mineral exploration in the Arctic. It will happen, it will expand, but it will expand slowly. And it's for exactly the same reason as, uh, as Kim mentioned before, small population density, no infrastructure or very limited infrastructure. That means that everything you want to do in the Arctic basically can be done easier somewhere else. And since minerals, we, everybody have referred to these rare earth minerals that are specific to the Arctic suddenly. No, they're all over the place. They're not rare at all. And they, 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 they exist in every continent, every country in the world, I guess you can find some extractable rare earth. But somehow they have become emblemic of the Arctic and now we think that it is, we need to extract them to uh, maintain our green transition, which is, which is absolutely nonsensical. Uh, so, anyway, uh, so I think what we will see, and I, I think that uh, for the oil and gas, uh, the fossil fuel uh, sector, Alaska and Russia in particular has a mature uh, uh, explo e exploitation of those resources, whereas for Canada it is uh, way behind that, and for Greenland it's definitely uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, um, very far, be, far behind that level, and Norway, of course, is kind of on the margin and moving into the Arctic, but, but has, uh, has, uh, has operations here. But I think we will see, uh, and particularly after this, this new IPCC report, that the, um, that the would you say, that the, uh, the, uh, the um, incentive to start or expand the extraction of fossil fuels from the Arctic region has to come down. I and mean, you, cannot, you, cannot, you cannot argue for it anymore, I think, in any meaningful way uh, as the world is today. So where does it leave us? I think it leaves us with the, uh, folk, uh, increasing attention on the uh, living resources in the Arctic, and particularly the marine living resources, which are an enormously uh, valuable uh, commodity for the global uh, community. We all need marine protein and lipids, and that's one of the, the Arctic region is one of the few regions where you actually have live living fish living in the water, and, uh, and you can actually fish something. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a tragedy, but, but that's, well, that's the way it is. And I think the most important thing we can do in multilateral management of the Arctic region is to make sure that we are prepared to manage the living resources in a world that is changing so rapidly that the management scheme you had yesterday, yesteryear will not work next year. So I think this, this understanding that the physical boundary conditions are changing so rapidly uh, needs a new management uh, scheme, but that the management of those resources is more important than ever before. And I'm sure that that will be the long-term, uh, um, you could say, extractive uh, industry that would be viable in, in the Arctic. But I think another thing that should not be forgotten is that it's not everything that has a value that can be extracted and sold somewhere. There are actually qualities within the Arctic itself that are worth preserving. And I think that that should also be uh, kept in, in focus. And some of these things may not have a monetary value, but they surely have a value for the world. And we just heard, we, we just heard uh, Catherine uh, mentioning the, the, the Gulf Stream, for instance. I mean, how would you put a price on the value of the Gulf Stream for, for Europe? Uh, who, who, who would give a bet, you know, how much are we... I mean, that, that's completely uh, uh, out, of, <laughs> out, of, out of any sense to, to try to monetize these qualities, but we need to appreciate they're there and try to protect them because they are essential for the world. When we see China talking about uh, Arctic need for, for a presence in the Arctic for research reasons, that is not only because they want to have a political presence, but it's also because the climate in China is rapidly changing because of what happens in the Arctic. The same in the east coast of America, they have these blizzards every winter now in New York and whatever. That is because what is happening in the Arctic Ocean. So everything that happens in the Arctic will be felt somewhere else in the world. And, that's, and, and, and again, of course, also the melting of the Greenland ice sheet will also have uh, impact with the rising sea levels and whatever. But I think that, that we should remember that everybody in the world would have a legitimate uh, right to understand what happens in the Arctic because it's what's happening in the Arctic today is going to hit everybody tomorrow somewhere else in the world or maybe later today. So with that, I, I, I think that, um, that uh, we must not look at the Arctic as a source of stuff. Arctic is also a region in its own right and it has value in itself and we have to preserve that value and that will pay back to us in many, many ways uh, in the future. So, thank you. Thank you very much.
That's the first spontaneous applause today. Well, this was because it was the best uh, intervention. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Monique. Um, as always, uh, thought-provoking um, beyond the usual. Um, now, are you optimistic that the political uh, uh, sectors of this world will actually heed the warning uh, that was issued by the IPCC now once again, uh, not for the first time, um, and recognize the significance of the Arctic in this context? I, 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 think, that, I think that we are have, there, there's always the, the, the situation, of course, that that those who are knowledgeable and, 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 and actually try to, to, uh, to be interested in these things have no difficulty on, in understanding. It's not difficult to understand these things. It's actually very, very explicit and very, very clear. And I, I think um, when we talk about the shocking news in this last uh, IPCC report, it's actually not because the predictions are different. It's because the level of confidence has gone up. But it's actually what has been said all along it's been set for 30 years, mm. uh, more or less, the same thing. And what this new report says is, instead of saying we think or it's relative, you know, it, it might be, and it's, you know, everything points more it, it's absolutely clear. And it also says ab absolutely clear that it is uh, uh, anthropogenic, it is a human, uh, human cause. But I would say that the message is the same. So I don't think that, that, uh, that uh, I mean, we have, we have no good excuse for not having acted <laughs> till now because we didn't know we didn't know. And now back to you uh, in uh, Catherine Lavelle in Ohio. Um, you're an expert on international institutions. Um, now, if we look at, for instance, the Arctic Council, uh, not excluding others, but, but, but for instance, the Arctic Council, uh, now, based on your own observation that there is no normative consensus in the Arctic, um, is there a hope that the Arctic Council will gather strength, um, get people together, and actually uh, provoke, promote, uh, and initiate action that squares with the challenge that Mini Rosing has, has just presented? Well, there's always hope. And I think that um, the, the promising direction that the Arctic Council has taken is in trying to create this space that is outside the framework of the military, not because it, it's not good to have the military in it, but just to create a zone, if you want to think, not a piece the way originally maybe it was postulated, but a, a zone where these discussions can take place. And I think the strength has been through the working groups, through the independent actions, through things like the Polar Code that have been instituted and coordinated with scientific research agreements. Um, all of that has been very promising so that they have actually resulted in treaties and hard law agreements that countries will, will, um, will, will work with. You know, I also think one thing about the Arctic Council that's very promising is the Russian chair going forward. And um, it, it seems promising to me. I, I noticed in the earlier panel, people skated around the, the great power question. They're, they talked about bilateral system or bipolar, whatever, I mean, the, the, the different words different panelists used. Bipolar. But the question of Russia as a part of that was kind of left hanging, whether or not Russia was a great power or part of this. In the Arctic, certainly Russia is a great power, and certainly Russia is, is an integral part of that solution. So um, in um, the, the, the uh, speeches that were easy to follow in the pandemic because we could stream them online, um, the, uh, Sergei Lavrov talked about the desire, whether or not this comes to pass or not, to have an Arctic uh, summit of, of leaders and to try to make that part of the framework. Now, I think a lot of eyebrows were raised about his statements about the military, but, but getting the heads of state together is a good thing for Russia because it returns Russia to this premier position. Oops. It's good. Can you hear me now? Ah, can you hear me? Yes, you're back. It's good, but it's good for the world to have these discussions taking place and um, to find areas of common interest where, and, and common purpose wherever we can. But, but I ask because I know the diplomats involved in Arctic cooperation, they're, they're very keen um, uh, to, to highlight uh, the achievements that you just mentioned, and, and, and they can speak for a long time about all the good things that the Arctic Council has achieved over the years. And I think there is a general consensus that it is quite remarkable, the level of cooperation that has been achieved uh, between the NATO countries and, and Russia in this context, including now also a lot of observer countries from around the world. But still, 
Uh, there is, I, and I return to this, I love this, 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 uh, this uh, wording of yours, that there is no normative consensus when it comes to the environment at a stage where, let's say, the Arctic is about to disappear, uh, to quote uh, the gentleman next to me. Uh, so, is there, is there I, mean, I mean, are we up to the challenge? Are we even close to action that will mitigate or, or even come close to solving the problem? Well, I, I'm, I'm neither a politician nor a representative of the United States at all. However, the benefit of being a researcher is that sometimes people will say things off the cuff to you. So my sense after I started studying the Arctic Council in the United States is, again, this variability among the working groups, some of them incredibly successful, producing great data and sharing and insights that we wouldn't have otherwise, and the hard framework agreements and, and the rest. But at the same time, let's not forget that there's other areas where, you know, off the record, people have just asked me, why is this organ why is this part of the organization? <laughs> I don't want to name anyone in particular, but why is this even here? What what is it doing? So that could be an American skepticism about multilateralism, but I just think it reflects more the part that in any organization, look at the United Nations system, look at the, the financial system, that there's always going to be areas that are more or less successful. And I don't think that's a judgment on the whole thing. I think there is a much more sanguine view of the Arctic Council in Europe. And there's also a much more sanguine view among diplomats and people who participate in it um, because of but because they see the achievements and maybe those achievements need to be trumpeted more to civil society. Thank you very much. Um, I can't help it, Kenneth, but uh, now that we have you in Copenhagen, um, and to draw on your experience, your political insights um, into the machineries in Washington, the the stand of central people in Washington. I, I mean, it's, it's too good to, uh, to leave it just sitting there. Um, so uh, can I please ask you, not particularly at this moment, but perhaps in five seconds or so, uh, to, to, to bring us your reflection. What's going to happen on the climate? Is, there, is the security concerns of the world, are they going to be overshadowed by the climate change issues, the challenge that climate change is presenting? Or how does security politics, politics intertwine with that of, of the environment, that of the climate. Um, we're talking of, I mean, the Arctic potentially disappearing as we know it today. Uh, so from your perspective, a key... Well, again, I, I'm very hopeful and I'm very no, 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 Catherine, sorry, I was asking Kenneth. Oh, well, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry about oh, that. I'm sorry. No, I I'm should sure have... I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, first of all, I, I, I do think that... Uh, there, that there is a kind of linkage between the security concerns and the climate change concerns in the sense that the governments that are the least transparent, uh, the ones that are often behind the security concerns that we in the West have, uh, are often the ones uh, who have the least effective environmental regulation and are, you know, moving. You see what China's doing on coal plants. You see, is, we talked earlier about uh, what's the, the unevenness of environmental protection in, in Russia. Uh, so there's that kind of a linkage, but it's, it, the linkage is, is not the kind of a linkage where uh, this, the Biden administration is not going to take action because of some security concern. Uh, the, the, the question is just the, the enormity of the problem as it is diagnosed and the possible remedies of it, which are you know, you move to electric cars. Well, the batteries have used huge amounts of carbon to manufacture them. Uh, my own personal favorite would be to move to next generation nuclear, something that's maybe helium cooled rather than water cooled, that has much further fuel cycle. I think that can actually make a major dent, but you say nuclear people go crazy. You go to solar, you're dependent on China in some capacity, and you haven't solved the storage issue. And you also have a carbon issue with the manufacturing. So the, the problem is uh, even if there were, the, 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 the solution is not, is, is really not obvious. And it, it, it also, in the sense that politics is involved because I think um, there, there's, a, there's a sense that in order to achieve the kinds of savings that need to be done, the kind of politics we need will inherently have to be illiberal in some ways. You're gonna have to tell people, give up cars, give up, give up meat, give up this, give up that. And so I think that there's a, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a democracy gulf as well, 
Um, and uh, the, uh, the person who I think has addressed this brilliantly is uh, Ralf uh, Fuchs, in, uh, who is this uh, center for uh, modern liberalism in Germany, a former Green Party member, and sort of recognized uh, this, the gulf that was arising uh, by some of these command and control things, which we've seen now in uh, Germany in particular. Uh, once the Greens started talking about uh, you know, getting rid of short-haul flights, and started, um, you know, moving away from where they had been. Their numbers started dropping. So, I think it's it is a, it is an, it is it is a unbelievably complex problem, without it with with an unbelievably complex set of solutions that, because the, the way the problem is so diagnosed, the solutions have to be so drastic that people won't consent to them, uh, in, in large parts of the West, is my sense, and, and, and elsewhere where development is needed as well. So I, did, I didn't answer your question, but no, 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 thought. no. But but of course there is no clear answer. I, I su suspect to these uh, really complex issues. Minik. No, I, I just think that there are. I mean, I think there are actually liberal ways uh, of, of addressing that. And one is that to uh, as, uh, assign a, a price to something that has a value. There's a lot of stuff that has an enormous value that doesn't have a price today. And so people, of course, would not uh, freely pay that price. But if actually we are, we are so carbon tax is, is, is one thing, and there could be several others that basically means that we pay for what we use. And that goes back to what we talked about before, that commodities is not only things you consume, it's actually also the capacity of the world to take care of your waste afterward. Uh, that is also a commodity in, in a sense. So if you pay the price for that, that at least will bring us some of the weight. I'm sure it can, will not solve all problems in one go, but. You look at you, you, add, you, you go on the, the computer, the Kennedy, Kennedy School, there's this uh, climate change uh, computer, I think we've all, a chart that we've all used, this website. You put in all these different things, and no matter what we do, it, it barely moves the needle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, that's, and that's, you know, with carbon pricing, and the thing that moved the needle the most, yeah. I put in was moving, you know, the nuclear above all else, but, but it still barely moved the needle. Last one. Uh, yes, um, uh, Minik, you, you raised the question of uh, biological resources, living resources, and you live, right, raised the question of sustainable management of bi li living resources, for example, fisheries. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that such management, it doesn't just have to be biologically sustainable, it also has to be socially equitable. Because, for example, Iceland has an extremely effective fisheries management system I think it's, uh, it's biologically sustainable, it's financially very efficient, but it transfers huge amounts of wealth, which belong to the Icelandic nation, to a narrow, uh, a narrow group of people. And we have challenges in Norway too. So, so you both have the, the biological sustainability uh, issues with such resource management, but you also have the social sustainability. And then just follow up quickly to Kenneth Weinstein. Um, I basically think that you have to solve, you have to fix democracy and fix inequality before you can fix climate change. Because if large parts of society, if large parts of society will not feel that they have a stake in the future, and if they will not feel that they benefit from the future, well, they, they neither can nor will invest in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, making it more complex uh, at this hour. Uh, we have a few more minutes uh, before I will ask Charlotte to, to close this conference. Um, so anybody who is still uh, uh, capable of speaking uh, and have a wish to do so, um, this is your moment. Sa Ors for you, please. Well, just to complicate things a little bit further, um, I was just sitting here thinking about, uh, first of all, the, uh, the lack of a normative uh, consensus. It also exists within the states. I mean, Greenland and Denmark is a great example of that, that there's not necessarily uh, agreement on what to mean about things in the world. But that is natural because the interests of the Greenlandic people and the Danish people are different mm -hmm. and the Faroes people. So again, it comes back to creating a system also internationally that actually is capable 
of including the small peoples or the peoples that are few in numbers and their point of views and their vo world views and so on. I think that is a task that the world really has to work on. Um, and uh, building on that and, and, and also you know, it, it, uh, further uh, complicating things, I have seen and I can really uh, understand the worries, for example, of the Sami people uh, on climate change mitigation activities that are then seen from the north as a new form of green colonization. Mm. So I think that in the international society's work with climate change mitigation, also there specifically, there's a very big need to, to uh, do that in a way that really respects the local communities, the peoples of the area that you're working in. Munich was touch touching upon it, but I think that what is really, really important, and I think that is something that's been said a million times, is to remember that although there's few people in Greenland, uh, in, in the Arctic, there are people. And they are developing their societies because that's what people do around the world. It's not you know, a, a very, very strange thing that it is happening, but that also needs to be you know, part of, of anything. And, and I think going back to the, to the security and military development, that again it is natural that there will be worries among those peoples that this could be a form of new colonization because it's the interest of the people in the south that is uh, at the top of the agenda thank you sarah that might be a beautiful way to finalize this conference uh, so uh, I'll do that and say thank you very much to Minik and to Catherine Lavelle in Ohio. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. And the final word goes to our host today, one of our hosts, Charlotte Flint Peterson from the Foreign Policy Society. I just, uh, I will keep it short, but. Uh, Inside, I'm full of uh, very exciting, very difficult, very complex news that all the fantastic panelists today have brought to me. Uh, and in which, you, on the one hand, you could see that they're, of, co of course, separate issues. But on the other hand, they're very much intertwined, which we have learned today. The issue of climate change can actually be a game changer also in terms of geopolitics, because, you know, all of a sudden, climate change becomes such a security issue that all other security issues are actually redundant, you could say. You know, what's the competition between the US and, 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 and China towards, you know, the wake-up call of an Arctic actually not being there? So these are the issues that the politicians will have to deal with, or uh, the issues of governance within the you could say the, the structures that we have that actually include the different voices that are within our states in a way that we have a much more, I would say, knowledgeable way of acting forward and in a way that includes much more, many more groups rather than just individuals that we each, each of us represents. So there's a lot of, I think, information. There's the solutions that the industry can provide to us, the data sharing, that we have to manage somehow so we don't, we still have our data on the one hand, but, but the data sharing can also provide solutions in terms of what do we do about climate change and when do we know and early warning systems and all these things. Uh, the ships that can give not only the, into the, the, the military domain, but can actually also provide infrastructure for um, our civilian lives in the Arctic. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm going from here with a very full head. I hope you have too as well. I just think we should thank the, all our panelists very much. So I, I'd like you to join in for a big hand. Also those in, in the, you know, beyond in, on, on, on our online and also for those who looked on um, during this session. I think everything has been recorded and I hope we will be able to see it on our homepage soon if you want to see it again. So a big hand to everybody. And of course, a very big hand to the Danske My Team Fund, who is the sponsor. <laughs>